Mr. Chair, are you ready for tomorrow? The election day? As ready as one can. We've got, we've got, uh, time at, um, town hall. Forum. what's that, Roger? You gotta be up at town hall. I will. Reading people. No, your high school, right? Trying to send me to town hall, Roger. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I think, I think they're voting for you at eight corners. Eight corners. Okay. All right, I think we have quorum. Should we wait a minute or two, see if Robin joins us? Rick DuPerry's on uh, super high wind duty tonight. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, we lost, we lost power here along Hackers Parkway in Scotto Hill. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah, we were out for a couple of hours, but we've got a generator. Oh, wow. Knock on wood, no problems yet here. All right, well, at six, I show 6.30. I say we get this thing kicked off. We've got a busy agenda. So that, I'm going to call this meeting to order. Welcome, everyone, to uh, November 2nd, uh, 2020, uh, Town of Scarborough Planning Board meeting. This is a continuance from the Monday, October 26th meeting. Uh, we have a pretty full agenda again. Um, First order of business uh, side. Um, actually, I'll ask for clarification on this, and maybe Rachel, you might know. Do we start this meeting like you would a typical meeting, or because it's a continuation, do we just kind of jump in? I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the rules are. I think we could probably start it if we want to. Uh, okay, so the only thing that I would um, say is that we do have the minutes. Uh, we had to table it meeting. Uh, we do have minutes available for the October 5th meeting. So I guess I'll rewind us to that point. Um, but first I'll call, I'll call uh, the roll just to make sure we can all check in. Uh, Rachel Hendrickson. Here. Roger. Roger Bealey. Yeah. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Robin Saunders. Rick DuPerry. Rick Meinking. Here. All right. I'm going to show that, um, uh, we are missing uh, Robin Saunders as a voting member and our first alternate, uh, Rick Meinking. So that would make, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Rick DuPerry. Rick Meinking becomes a voting member for this evening's agenda. Um, so the first order on sites of business is the approval of the October 5th, 2020 minutes. I don't know if everyone had a chance to review those. Um, if you had, I will entertain a motion to approve them as presented. Second. Okay. Motion in a second. Uh, any discussion? Uh, all in favor, I'll call the roll again. Rachel Hendrickson. Uh, aye. Yes. Uh, Roger Bealey. Yes. Jennifer Ladd. Rick Meinking. Yes. Nick McGee, yes. So that is unanimous. Thank you. All right. We left off on item number 14, state manufactured homes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to quickly jump into the protocol here. Remember to read my uh, disclaimer before every one of these meetings. Uh, this is a remote meeting using Zoom. People can access the meeting by going to this page and for viewing only, click on the YouTube link. For the virtual and provide public comment at this meeting, you can click on the Zoom link. The planning board recommends written public comment prior to an upcoming meeting. At this time, given the remote video conference meeting format, directions can be found on the planning board's webpage. Please are muted and must raise their hand to be called on during the public comment parts of the agenda. Please only raise your hand once it's uh, time for public comment and not during the applicant's presentation or board deliberation. If the chair happens to drop off the meeting difficulties, the vice chair shall uh, start running the meeting until the chair returns. All right, disclaimers over with. We are to item number 14, State Manufactured Homes, Inc. requests an advisory opinion for a miscellaneous appeal for an expansion of a legal non-conforming map R56, lots 11 and 12. Jim out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this project's in the R2 zoning district, uh, the existing Pinecrest 
manufactured housing community. Um, so they have applied for a miscellaneous appeal uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals for the expansion of illegal non-conforming use. As you may recall, uh, in accordance with the zoning ordinance, uh, before making a decision on any miscellaneous appeal, uh, the ZBA shall refer the appeal to the planning board for an advisory opinion. So the applicants proposing to expand their existing community uh, from its current size of 111 units uh, to 143 total units, an expansion of 32 units. The staff has provided the board uh, with, with several comments for your consideration related to the proximity of the resource protection and shoreland overlay zoning districts, uh, buffering between the proposed development and the Scarborough Connector Highway, and the required coordination with South Portland, giving site access and sewage disposal will be directed through that municipality. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. And for the end, either Teresa or Andy. Yes, good evening. Uh, can, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jamel. And, and I'd just like to say um, at the start of this meeting, thank you to the, uh, to the planning board and staff for accommodating this meeting. As, as you'll appreciate and as Jamel under, uh, explained, uh, we're going through a fairly complex process approval process for this project and we're actually on the agenda for the zoning board uh, in November so uh, it really helps us out a lot that you scheduled this meeting rather than putting us off uh, otherwise potentially we could have been backed up another month at the zoning board so we certainly appreciate you accommodating us um, for this hearing. Um, just to explain a little bit the process that we're going through and the reason we're going through this process as you're probably aware um, there is a state statute that governs the regulation of manufactured housing communities and that allows for um, certain accommodations, including expansion of existing uh, manufactured housing communities where they are in municipalities currently. Um, the zoning ordinance in the town of Scarborough is not quite fully aligned with the state statute in that um, this is still considered a non-conforming use in the zone. And that requires us to go through the appeals process to, to apply for an expansion that, that under the state statute appears to be allowed by right. So that's the reason we're here. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk you through the, the, the format of what we're looking at. Uh, I don't know if, if Jamel, if you want to hand over controls or can hand over controls to me so I can show my screen or whether you'd prefer to just show the plan yourself, either way works for me. I can jump in. I think you're able to share, Andy. Let's try this. Can everyone see that? Okay. Yeah. So this is the uh, existing Pinecrest manufactured housing community. This is the Scarborough Connector. Uh, my apologies for the orientation of this plan. Uh, as you'll see, it's kind of backwards. You'll see the, the north arrow pointing downwards towards the right there. Um, unfortunately, that's the way the survey plan was set up. So to read all the text properly, this is the way we have to orient it. So this is the Scarborough Connector. This is the existing Pinecrest manufactured housing community. And Main Street South Portland is actually down here, which is the entrance and exit to the community. So what State Manufactured Homes is proposing to do here is to expand the community through uh, a gap between two of the existing units out onto an upland area uh, to the west of the existing community and then across this land which is actually uh, the Portland Water District's transmission main a 36 inch transmission main runs through here so we have to go across there with the road and then expanding with further units uh, on the west by the Scarborough connector here as Jamel mentioned, there is a resource protection zone associated with the Nunsuch River, which is right up in this corner of the site here. These are the approximate limits of the resource protection zone and the approximate limits of the shoreland overlay zone. Uh, and we can get into a little more detail of that as we, as we get further along. Essentially what the uh, special exception and the miscellaneous appeals process requires us to do or requires the planning board to consider and, and requires us to demonstrate is that the proposed expansion of this use is not going to cause unhealthful conditions and generally speaking is not going to be incompatible with any of the uses surrounding it. Um, as you can see, 
the only uses surrounding where we are expanding here is in fact the existing Pinecrest housing community. The nearest residential community is actually in South Portland, right down at the bottom of the screen here. Uh, and these are the abutting streets. Uh, there are also some residences, I believe, along Main Street here and some commercial uses along Main Street. So this is really tucked away behind the existing community uh, and between that and the Scarborough connector. The existing community and the proposed expansion will both be connected to public sewer and public water. Uh, the public sewer actually drains by an, an existing pump station located right here in the, uh, in the existing community and pumps to South Portland. Um, we have talked to the folks in South Portland and we actually have a capacity letter. We just received the capacity letter or sewer from those folks today. Uh, we're actually meeting with, with uh, Portland Water District to do some test pits on their transmission main tomorrow morning. Um, and they have uh, indicated that they do have, obviously they do have capacity it's right next to their transmission main and they're willing to continue to serve this and the expansion uh, under certain conditions. And obviously they're a little sensitive about the crossings over this transmission main and rightly so, which is why we're doing the test pits. And then we have to show them by, uh, by what we're designing that we're not going to interfere with the, uh, the construction or the operation of that existing main. I pointed out the resource protection zone and the shoreland overlay zone down in this corner. There's also a large freshwater wetland uh, actually in this area of the site. Um, it's between the residential community that's in South Portland and the Portland Water District transmission main. And there's a good reason for that. Um, all the drainage from these communities actually comes out through pipes right onto the uh, Pinecrest property, um, which I guess was the way things were done back in the day. Um, so the street drainage from South Portland actually comes onto the property before the uh, Portland Water District main was constructed there in the 60s, it's very likely that, that all this, because the land pitches in the direction towards the Nunsuch River, it's very likely that this just drained over land and ended up in the river. However, when they constructed the water main, they actually raised the land over the water main and hence they trapped some of the drainage in here. There is an existing ditch that runs here and a culvert that crosses that water main but a large amount of that surface water gets trapped in here and it's eventually naturalized into a wetland. So we have had that wetland delineated um, and those are the extents that, that are shown on the plan. That's why there is no further expansion shown up in this area. Um, and it is really limited to the upland areas. There will be some minor wetland impact in the areas where the existing drainage ditch, which has also naturalized, has been flagged as a wetland and of course, for two reasons we need to maintain that. One, just to maintain the drainage around the existing community, and two, to capture the water that, that comes off the new improvements. So essentially this is the new road. This is 20 feet wide, which is what is required for manufactured housing communities. The water and sewer runs down here. There'll be hydrants on it. And what we've shown in blue are, uh, they may be a little overstated in size, but these are bioretention cells um, that will serve to, to treat stormwater runoff from the new development. Uh, this will create enough disturbance to trigger stormwater law, so we'll be going through the state for stormwater permits, as well as having to meet the town's stormwater ordinance. Uh, that's all a little further down the road, and, and as you'll appreciate, a lot of these details will get filled in as we progress a little further along. This is a fairly, fairly conceptual level plan that you see it in front of you. And so what we're asking for this evening is, is for some input from the planning board and uh, a positive recommendation to the zoning board so we can proceed forward with this. I'll be happy to take any questions that uh, folks from the board have uh, and just I'll leave it over to you for discussion. Hey Sandy. Uh, we do have an opportunity for public comment on this item. If there's anyone here in attendance that would like to uh, speak on this item, please use the raise my hand feature in the lower right hand corner of your screen. All right, seeing none, I'm going to turn it over to the planning board. Uh, Roger, do you want to kick off on this one? Sure. 
I actually, um, I have a question for the applicant, but I also have a question for Jamal. Um, I'm kind of curious. I, I did take a ride through this area uh, the other day, and this is for the applicant, I guess. Um, the staff, um, the only, one of the things the staff recommends is a robust buffering between the, um, the connector, Scarborough connector. I noticed right through there that that's, that area is all wooded right now. Um, what what plans do you have for for dealing with the buffering along the connector? Well, I can answer that in two ways. I mean, firstly, we're keen to keep as much of the wooded area around the fringes of the development as we can, obviously. And if you've been down there, it's actually it's pretty attractive woodland. There will be some trees, uh, and as you'll notice, there are some some very large pine trees in there, and where those come close to to the proposed expansion, that would obviously offer some, some degree of hazard towards the new houses. And they don't really offer very much shielding on the low level anyway. So we would, um, we would move towards taking out anything that, is, that, that poses a threat to the new development, but retaining as much of the woodland around the edges as we possibly can. Uh, I think we will certainly consider, and particularly in the lots um, down on this corner of the expansion, we will certainly consider filling in with some new plantings, uh, lower in, in the uh, some more understory type plantings. As you'll appreciate if you've been out there, a lot of the cover in, in this area and along the woodland is fairly high. So we want some infill plantings along here. And we'll that's one of the things that we'll certainly look at in, in great detail as we move forward. Okay, and the, uh, the question I have for Jamal is, um, I just kind of curious, Jamal. Um, Andy mentioned how how the Scarborough um, ordinance doesn't line up exactly with the states, and I was wondering if that had to do with the type of um, construction or the type of units. Uh, for instance, I assume that these new units will be very similar. When you drive in there, and you, if, when you first go in there, if you take your very first right, those dwellings are different than the ones if you were to go left. They're more, they're more similar to the newer de uh, development down at Hillcrest. Is that correct? And that's, that's Andy, that's what you plan to do up at the, at the new area? Yeah, that's correct. I think what, you, what you're likely to see, and there may be some differences based on, you know, the lot size and the lot configuration and people, frankly, people's choices as to what sort of units they want. But if you take a ride around Hillcrest, for example, I mean, you see some of the newer units that are going in there. There's a variety. I mean, some of them are two story, some of them are single story, um, but they're, they're very definitely of the modern era of manufactured housing. They're, they're very, very efficient, very well manufactured units and, and very good looking units as well. So yeah. my question to Jamal is, what do we, is there a, different definition between the type of structures that are in the original phase of Pinecrest versus these newer, which look more like a conventional home? Yeah, so Roger, maybe I'll try to jump in and, and answer some of that question. It, and frankly, maybe um, the applicant may be even in a better position to answer the difference between sort of the, the newer model units as opposed to what's out there currently. But I think your first question was sort of around, um, you know, is our zoning out of date with respects to the type of units? And I would say it's not so much around the type of units as we've defined um, both mobile homes and manufactured housing units. And it's, it's a little bit, our, our, as uh, Andy mentioned, I think already, our zoning ordinance um, is very clunky in that we do allow for mobile home parks in the RF and the RFM district. However, in those districts that we allow these type of communities, our ordinances and density provisions and other things, that's where we don't align with the state regulations. And this is actually an issue that the, the town grappled with. I can remember a number of years ago, um, I think it was back in 09 or 10, when we did a bunch of rezoning in the RF and RFM areas and we sort of struggled and grappled with that issue and ultimately 
um, that didn't get resolved at that time. And it's one that, you know, we staff is aware needs to get addressed next time we sort of take a bite at those RF and RFM districts. Within the R2 district where we're at, um, those type of communities are actually aren't listed as an allowed use. So it makes it actually a clearer pathway for this application because it is very clearly a non-conforming use because the type of use isn't overall permitted. And so it actually makes sort of this, this pathway forward a little more clear than even if it were in the RF and RFM where we allow the uses, but yet our, our and this is where it really starts to get complicated, where our local ordinances don't align with state statute, the town, staff, planning board, we have to apply our state, our, our local regulations, regardless of sort of what state statute said, and that becomes a, a whole murky area. So fortunately, that's not the type of situation we're dealing with here. And we, as I just said, sort of do have this pathway forward with respect to expansion of non-conforming use, and then really looking at it in terms of, um, you know, those, those standards uh, with respect to sort of uh, cohesiveness uh, of the neighborhood, if you will. Um, it will come back to the board, it should be mentioned, for a subdivision review. But at that time, because this is in the R2, and, and should it get Board of Appeals approval for the expansion of nonconforming, we won't look necessarily to the R2 space and bulk standards, but what we will look to is sort of the more uh, community-wide standards that are in the uh, subdivision ordinance around the typical things we think about, stormwater, access, uh, fire protection, emergency protection, those sorts of things. So um, I hope that starts to help address your question in some sure, way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'm all set, Nick. Thanks, Roger. Rachel? Yeah, um, actually, Roger was kind of uh, asking the, the question that I had, and Jay. Uh, Jay's answer was uh, was very helpful. Um, I I, uh, I guess I part of my concern was the difference in lot sizes in in one area of the uh, of the park, uh, the community, and then in this new area, it appears to be larger uh, larger lots, um, and. That goes then to, I guess, to the question of, of community uh, and community standards. I, I guess one of the concerns that I, I have, and it's probably uh, more to the to come up at the the uh, subdivision review, um, is the question of what the topography of the land is around there. Because as I looked at the map, it did appear as though this is not uh, on the, I don't know whether it's the north or the west or whatever side of the um, uh, Portland Water District, uh, that the lot appears to be in need of a fair amount of grading. And given the sensitivity of the area and the Nonsuch River and the closeness to the shoreline, uh, shoreland overlay, um, I, I would have concerns. Um, but I, I, as I said, I suspect that that uh, really is not um, for us at this meeting, but simply to take at this meeting to take a look at uh, an expansion of a, a non-conforming use uh, and a request for an advisory opinion. So that's um, that's what I'm looking at. Those are my concerns, um, and I would hope that the uh, applicant, uh, should this get back to us, so. Uh, Starts to to consider those. I I do have a lot of issues around the sensitivity, uh, the ecological sensitivity of that area. Uh, I also uh, do think that um, robust buffering is going to be needed. That Scarborough uh, connector is not a silent street, uh, and folks when they move in, I would hope at least have some sort of protection from the, uh, from the noise. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Jen? I just want to make sure I understand the 
proposed impacts, I guess. Um, it looks to me as though, based on what's shown and understanding that that's, um, you know, preliminary at this point, and said there to change as you move through your development process, but um, that you're showing uh, only a storm, an area of stormwater treatment and perhaps some clearing within the shoreland overlay zone, is that correct? And some grading, um, probably based on Rachel's comment. That is correct. And, and maybe I can answer Rachel's comment a little bit there. Um, the land generally slopes actually fairly gently towards the Nunsuch River down along um, along the spine of that new road. Um, and the soil conditions are fairly sandy in there. So we're actually hopeful that we'll be able to reuse quite a lot of the upper regions of the soil there. Um, it's all sandy to about four feet. and We're not intending to do much below four feet. And we'll certainly try to avoid um, any grading any deeper than that. Um, so there will be, you know, there will be a bit of earthwork to, to clear and to stump the land. We're not anticipating a huge amount of grading on this site. Frankly, we're going to use the, the land the way it is, is the way it is topographically right now and use the grades to our advantage and just slope it down just the way it is right now. Okay, and so do you, um, based on that, do you, are you predicting any sort of impact beyond the shoreland overland zone into um, the, the resource protection area? No, we're, we're actually, what, what you'll see there, um, our intention is, I mean, for one, we, we've, we've kind of oversized, in our judgment, we've oversized the stormwater treatment that we need because we wanted to make sure that we leave enough space. So we're not coming back, you know, with a plan that shows further encroachment than, than what we're showing at this, at this early stage, even though it is a very early stage of the project. So our intention is to keep a, a buffer of at least 150 feet from the Nunsuch River um, and it may well approach 200 feet. Okay, that's helpful. So, so you, you're thinking that you may only develop that lower, or in this case, I guess, towards the top of the page, that stormwater treatment area um, as sort of a last resort if you need that based on calculations. I, I think we'll need something in that area. I think generally what we're showing in all these areas is larger than what we're going to need. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would just think that that, particularly in that um, area, given its proximity to the other sensitive um, parts of this, um, you know, zone and river, um, you know, we probably just want to look for the least amount of impacts there as possible. Um, but yeah, we look forward to seeing how those calculations turn out and um, that's that's what I had questions on. Are there anything else that's already been answered? Jen, uh, Rick Miking. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything, any other questions that weren't already addressed by uh, other members, um, but I do think that buffering along that uh, connector is going to be going to be key. Um, just one real quick question. Has this been communicated to uh, the folks there that the, the road there from Topaz Drive that's going to enter into the new development has those abutters to that road? Are they aware that this is in the pipeline? Um, has that been brought up or would you be, you know, maybe talking to them prior to submitting this to the planning board for subdivision? I can't answer that question directly because I don't know, um, but certainly we will. Um, and they'll certainly be aware, everybody will, will be aware that there is some activity going on there. Uh, and say we, we have done test pits on the site already. and We'll be doing more tomorrow at the, uh, at the Portland Water District. Um, I wish I could answer that more directly, but I don't. I don't directly know whether they have been contacted or not. Okay. Well, I, I have nothing further, Chair. I can jump in if you want about notices. Um, as part of subdivision, the town will um, notice abutters within 500 feet 
And we did note in our comments that it may require joint review by the South Portland and Scarborough Planning Board. So that's something we need to work with our town attorney on as it comes forward in terms of notices. Thanks, Jamil. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think my colleagues, the bulk of this, Andy, is it fair to say, though, uh, in reviewing the staff comments that uh, you're pretty much going to uh, do your best to kind of comply with some of the recommendations if it does come back to us for uh, subdivision review. Yeah, I don't think there was anything in there, frankly, that we that was unexpected to us. So yeah, they're all they're all topics that are on our mind already. Great. All right. Um, so with that, I mean, I think the general sense. If I if I misread it, please somebody on the board speak, uh, speak up. But the general sense here is that we would like to see this continue on to ZBA for their review. Um, giving it a, uh, a warm endorsement from the board to, to get to the next level. Is that fair? Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, Jamel or um, Jay, do you need anything more formalized than, than that? No, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you Good very much. You. Thank you. All right, our next item on tonight's agenda is uh, number 15, Meadow Woods Associates LLC requests a site plan amendment review at Storm Road Assessor's Map R58, Lot 18. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this one is located in the R4 zoning district along Gorham Road. The applicant's proposing to expand the existing parking area on the property by 11 spaces. But the, the proposal also includes a new stormwater uh, element and landscaping. So staff had a few uh, pretty minor comments. Um, one of them was related to the uh, three existing light fixtures that are proposed to be relocated. Uh, staff uh, recommended a, a, a lighting plan and cut sheets of the fixtures to ensure the proposal uh, meets the existing site plan standards. Staff also suggested uh, some landscaping within one of the islands in the parking area that didn't have landscaping. And finally, uh, based on previous discussions uh, with public safety here in town, the applicant did include an area on the plan identified as emergency access to the schools to the west and staff has recommended a formal easement be provided as part of this process to, uh, to help formalize uh, this important connection uh, between properties and staff did uh, draft a motion for the board's consideration this evening if you guys get there thank you thanks jamal and for the applicant uh mr berg is it you this evening kylie Sure, it's um, so Mason. my name is there Kylie is. Mason from Sebago Technics. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before we get going, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I know you've been incredibly generous with your time and having these extra meetings. It means a lot uh, for all of our applicants. Uh, and with that, I'll try not to take too much of your time. So just quickly uh, with me tonight is Mr. Berg. Uh, he represents uh, the owner or the applicant um, from Meadowood Associates. I'd like to share my screen with you really quickly um, just to orient you to the plan. So just from an existing conditions perspective, and I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, um, but can you see my hand on the screen? Okay. So just to orient everyone, this is generally the area that we're speaking of. There's an existing dumpster, which you'll see relocated, well, not relocated, but in its exact location on the plan. What we're doing is really wrapping the parking lot um, this aisle around creating new parking over here and a new um, parking bay in this location, which looks like this. Um, and so what that results in is a net increase in 11 spaces. And that's really just to meet the demands of the current residents uh, in the development. Um, to give you an idea of what this looks like from a street view perspective, I just pulled up Google Earth really quickly. So you could see that turn around the dumpster area, um, the area where the parking will be going. Um, we will be removing these trees and proposing new ones uh, to place around the dumpster area. And we will lose a couple of these white pines, but largely that is, um, that is the project. We are providing stormwater on the project. Um, it's not uh, required from a stormwater perspective for a DEP, but um, we have talked with Angela. We think it's a, um, a good thing to provide additional stormwater and we have put that into the plan. In terms of lighting, it is shown on um, the relocation of the of the fixtures that is shown in our plan. 
Um, we're happy to submit photometrics and cut sheets um, as a condition of approval if the board is open to that. Um, in terms of the easement, just very quickly, um, we were showing a proposed connection opportunity here. We would ask that we not make that a formal easement until the town um, moves forward with that. We would ask the town um, take the first steps so that we know that the easement would be useful and necessary. Are you all set, Kylie? I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Uh, for this, we do have the opportunity for public comment. If you're here in attendance and would like to speak on this project, please use the raise my hand, lower right hand corner of your app. All right. Seeing then, I'll turn this over to the board. I'm just going to throw this out um, in general uh, to the big neighbor request with this. Um, and then uh, probably should talk a little bit about uh, the easement uh, in the sense that I clarify with uh, staff if uh, the applicant's suggestion um, is what they've expected for the easement, um, kind of holding off until the town indicates one way or another if that's what they want or if the town is already indicating that that's what they want. I can jump in. That to Jay or jump in or Angela. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I know that uh, the, the town and the applicant have been speaking of a formal um, connection, but I guess I guess I'd ask Angela. I know she's been working with this a little bit more than me. Just if uh, the town would be willing to take on the easement, or if should we, if we could be held off as a condition. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, I know I met out there. I know Steve Berg is on the call. Um, so maybe he could speak to this a little more. Um, I know I met out there with um, our deputy fire chief at the time, who's no longer there, trying to figure out um, emergency uh, evacuation plans for the school campus. Um, and where the middle school and the school is set back there, it's pretty isolated in one way in and out, um, which is a concern for them. So I know we met in, um, Steve was very open to the idea and having that conversation. I will say it hasn't progressed since, so I understand the request on delaying um, until we have a more formal plan. However, I, um, I guess I would kind of put it back if Steve could speak to the concerns he might have um, about formalizing that, that might be helpful. Sure. Um... This is Steve. And Steve again, thanks. Thank you for the board meeting again tonight. Um, yeah, at the time I met with the deputy chief, and again, we right now have an uh, informal bridge that crosses a little um, drainage ditch that separates the properties where kids go back and forth through the woods to school. Um, and he was asked, you know, looking in the future, you know, for possible different scenarios, um, if there was a way, if a, a more formal roadway or something could, and that's why we showed it, but where there's no meeting road on the other side, or we don't know what's going to come in. You know, we obviously want to work to, you know, make this possible, but I also don't want to um, tie the land down to it without, you know, giving a formal easement where there's, there's, no, you know, we don't know what we're giving it to at this point. Um, I can make it some sort of condition that, so the town, you know, will work together. Um, I don't mean to make up words, but you know, I just don't want to put something formal there when it just it'll it burn the it'll burden the property without any you know reason at this time. If there's actually something coming forward, we, we always want to work with the town on those things. So, I don't know if I can answer any better than that, but that's where we're at. So it sounds like, and, and I guess I would be in agreement, it's something kind of in between, right? Is there some way to, and that's where I think I, the planners come in maybe to come up with some language on what that could look like or showing it say on the plan, but for future discussions or something. Yeah, we've done it right, It is shown on the plan for future discussion right now. Okay. And okay. I don't know how you formulate that condition though, so. 
I think what we've seen in past, and uh, forgive me, I can't remember how it's framed right now. It's been a few weeks since I looked at it, but I think it was something like future potential access, or I think um, the way way we've seen it before uh, might be just to say uh, future easement or emergency access or something to that effect. Just I think clarifying the language just a little bit um, would be sort of that intermediate step. Um, recognizing, you know, we, as I think Angela's already said, it, you know, I think it would be, there's, there are no immediate plans for the town to do anything, <laughs> um, but it's really just about securing that future potential. Um, there'd be the opportunity, as Angela said, to create some type of emergency pathway, whether that be a road, a pedestrian, who knows what that is. There's obviously, as was mentioned, at least some type of uh, water feature to cross might be some wetlands. It may never be actually feasible to build a full road, but what you know, what could be done is is unknown. We haven't explored. The town hasn't explored explored that fully. So, I think maybe just taking a look at the language that's on that plan and doing some tweaking there might be that halfway bridge. And, and I would say, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Another thing that would be an opportunity is I think the fire department does seek a lot of grants and opportunities through that, like if it was through Homeland Security or something like that, as far as evacuation plans and things, it would be helpful to know that the landowner is supportive of that and, and could maybe help in those kind of applications if they are going for grant opportunities to try to, um, try to work with us on that. So I noticed that our and board member so Lad. As far as oh. Kylie and Steve, is it? I mean, are you are you comfortable with some some language on there saying possible future connection or easement? Absolutely. So, yeah. Right. So the plan actually does have that listed exactly that way. Um, the note was actually taken. Um, it's a similar note that was applied um, in Oak Hill uh, for a similar uh, future easement connection. And so we use the same language um, that was applied at Oak Hill for this project as well. So um, we could change the potential future emergency access to school to possible to, I mean, it could just be future, take the potential off and call it future. I mean, it's a simple word at it, but the intention remains the same and it is recorded on the plan. All right, so okay. I guess my next question is Jamel, are we, uh, okay on the draft motion on the language was i'm working through like it that. um okay we'll see what i come up with I, right. I, might, I might wonder if the board would be comfortable if i think the intent is pretty clear at least in my estimation and, and i think we're very close if the board's comfortable with staff just working with the applicant you know it could be just to revise the language rather than trying to new, have Jamel sit there, try to pay attention to what we're talking about here and wordsmith all at once, um, maybe just make the condition a little more general. And we, you know, it sounds like if this is the direction the board wants to go. I saw Rachel with her hand up and Jennifer. So uh, Rachel. Oops, there we go. Uh, yeah, I, I was uncomfortable with the provision of the formal easement. So I think, um, something that allows some additional negotiation or discovery in terms of whether whether it's actually needed or not, something that expresses the goodwill of uh, the parties to enter into that sort of a discussion uh, with the town would, would work for me. And um, if it's a case of the uh, planning board working with the applicant to come up with something that's agreeable to both of the town and the applicant, then I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I did have a, a question, uh, and as you, as I saw the street view, um, it looked as though there were mailboxes in the area that you're proposing to put the, uh, yeah, there they are. Is they, uh, are they going to remain where they are? They are. Um, this, this turnaround uh, actually remains um, just as it was, and this okay. would actually turn out into it. So it actually... I think probably improves the, the turning radius over here a little bit, provides an alternative path around it. Okay, thank, thank you. I, I, was, I was not clear on that. I, I have no more questions. Thanks, Rachel. Jennifer? Um, 
I was just curious where, so when there were prior conversations um, regarding this property and emergency access to the school, what was the, uh, where was that intended to go to? Like, um, it looks, I'm just looking sort of on my own off to the side, it looks like there's a turnaround or a pullout or something on Green Needle Drive, is that right? Is that where this, where the, the other end of said easement would um, so, come out? So this is the development in this location. This is the existing parking lot here. This is the school in this location. So the proposal was to essentially directly connect um, okay. into the parking lot. So where's that? Can you, okay. But if I, if I might, I think uh, what during those discussions, and Angela, correct me if I go astray here, I think that the, the fire department at the time, public safety was really exploring sort of multiple options. I think they were looking at the end of Green Needle as well. So this really is, as, as we've already said, there is no defined plan. There's no clear answer. This is really about keeping options open. Preserving options, really yeah. What the discussion is about. Sure, um, and I think it's terrific foresight by all involved, really. Um, my only comment, given that clarification, thank you, would just be that, um, and we've kind of already touched on this, but uh, minor wordsmithing to the end that maybe the option be preserved that this not even necessarily be for emergency access, um, understanding a sensitivity to not opening this up for a full um, vehicular pickup or drop off, but that there could be a lot of other ways that um, an easement like that could be useful to a school site without being just for emergency access at all, ped, ped access or something like that. Right. Thank um, you. Can I speak? Yes, okay. go ahead. Um, as I was mentioning before, there currently is a pedestrian path that goes from where we're showing that right approximately there um, into the school. So it's informal, there's nothing in writing. Um, again, we don't have a problem with that if you wanna do something like that. Um, it's more of if it was gonna be a road, we are a little more concerned. Sure, that makes sense to me. And um, the, only, the only reason I mention it is because, um, you know, not saying that this is on the table or anything, but properties do change hands. And while the current program here and property owner is amenable to that type of access, um, without words to that effect, there's, you know, the town could potentially lose that connectivity if um, the property were to change hands. And I do think, you know, given the, the current use there, I think it's a really important um, link to the site and something that a lot of our neighborhoods don't necessarily have. So I would just um, be in favor of keeping that to whatever extent everyone was comfortable with at this stage in the game. So if I can ask that to see, would you be more comfortable with what Jen is proposing more of a, say a 10 foot kind of easement for pedestrians at this time and for future um, emergency access to be kind of determined? I'd be willing to consider it. We, we do that currently at the West Oaks apartment. Um, it's, I can't remember the term we came up with, but it's a public walk or private walkway for public use, something along those lines. And yeah, I, I agree with Jen. I think it's great for the neighborhood having the connectivity, um, you know, because kids will find the shortest path. So even if it doesn't, the people living in the apartment, kids up on Maple Avenue with the new walkway can come through, cut through to the back of the school, save, you know, a little time. Um, it's more of a vehicle, vehicular, I'd be more concerned, but mm -hmm. um, pedestrian, I, I think that's you know, fine. Roger. Yes, um, I, I have no problem with the conversation as it's transpired so far, but just an observation. Um, Steve mentioned that there's also already a path that the kids use to go through there. Is that correct, Steve? That is, that's correct. Yes, Roger. Um, when, when you're first talking about this, I, I envision a, a connector sort of like the one that's off of, um, I think it's, is it Maple Avenue that goes across from uh, Ab Abigail? Are you familiar with that, Jay? Yeah. Uh, 
that's like a maybe a I don't know an eight foot wide path or something like that. Um, but it seems to me once we get Glen Road the way we want it with the complete streets and everything, encouraging more pedestrian traffic, you will have more kids going to the middle school going through your property, Steve, because it's shorter than going all the way around to, is it Quentin? Is that what it is? Mm -hmm. You know, to get up there by the library. So, um, and then the only other, if you're just doing a path, and I don't know if this still pertains, but I know when the middle school was being uh, built, um, there, were, there were discussions about pathways going down to Sawyer Road because kids had already established informal pathways but it was decided not to pursue formal pathways because once you do that, you, you, you have to abide by a series of regulations, you know, AD, uh, ADA regulations and things such as that. So just, I don't know if that's, that's still in play, Angela, you know, I don't know, just throwing out a thought. I would say if there is a, a like you said, a path that's kind of worn and it's been over time <laughs> um, and you're saying, you have access rights over it. We can always say that as I think once you get in and start improving it, then you probably have to hit standards. Um, I would agree with that as far as like ADA and that such um, thing. But as far as just getting, I guess, more formal rights, um, I understand it sounds like Steve's providing that access, but to yeah. formalize that and then say in the future, um, we could say improve it as a pedestrian walkway. I think that's when you get into what you're talking about, Roger, is making it comply with other, all the requirements. I'm all set. Nothing more to add. Uh, any other planning board comments on this, Rick? Everything to? All right. Uh, Jamel, do you have some general language for us to review here, real quick? I think Jay's going to actually share it. All right. I'm getting there in just a moment. Are you seeing the motion at this point? I see. Uh, I see the first page. Can you just cut down to the easement section to see if the language is uh, suitable for the parties here at the table? That does Provide look like the one that I worked on. So. Uh. Why don't you get out of it, Jay, and I'll bring it up. Okay. Sorry, guys. You guys see this? Yes. Yes. So the the new need to coordinate with the town with regards to a formal connection emergency pedestrian, et cetera, and the future to the school property to the west as discussed with the planning board. Getting any warm and fuzzies on that? Yeah, I think that uh, that leaves some leaves the, the flexibility. Um, it allows the uh, parties to reach an agreement. And, and so is if they hit a stumbling block in there, I, I, I suspect that planning would elevate it back up to the planning board if, uh, or even the applicant possibly at that point, if they, they don't see a, an agreement coming to fruition, does that sound reasonable? If that works for staff. Uh, my my what concern staff is, is there any time limit for these discussions or are we talking back to the planning board in four years when something can't be agreed on. The, the way it reads is this is to be done before the issuance of the building permit. And applicant, how do you, uh, Steve, and, and how do you feel about that? Uh, I think we can work with the town on it. I'm sorry, what was that? I think we can work with the town, you know, the planning department to get okay. the, you know, what they need. All right. Well, that said, uh, I guess I'll read this motion. Um, Mr. Chair, if I may, um, yeah. um, I would just like to uh, consider, um, there's two notes on here that I think um, 
Well, then that would be um, note E, the wooden guardrail and other hardscape feature between the parking area and the proposed underdrain soil filter, as well as a note indicating when the lights will be dimmed on the site. I think um, there's some logistic concerns uh, for the applicant that we would prefer not to put up a wooden guardrail or hardscape feature between that parking edge and the soil filter, as well as um, uh, dimming lights on the site, given the residential nature of it. I believe their preference is to keep the light levels at a safe um, at a safety level the entire evening. All right, let's take up those two topics real quick uh, with the board. Um, wooden guardrail, can you, can you, uh, Packet here. What's um so specifically, Kylie? What is the uh, major concern with the wooden guardrail suggestion? I think it's just a, a frankly, it's a cost and logistics. It's one more thing for them to maintain. It's certainly something that they need to consider. If there is a sign in front of it, as it is already, I believe that note is on there for stormwater uh, and for snow plowing to keep them from plowing into the area. Um, I would think that we could probably handle it in the same way um, with the sign remaining intact and simply adding a boulder to the edge of the parking lot um, off the corner there as opposed to a, a formal guardrail. So a couple landscaping boulders would do the same trick, right? I think that was the intent of the comment when you talk about something hardscape is a lot of times the planning board reviews people um, are putting boulders there in the way so you can't just push the snow directly in because regardless of what you tell them to do at three in the morning they're going to push snow into that. Right. So applicant you're comfortable with some landscape boulders there in, in lieu of a fence? Yes we are. Uh, Mr. Chair I would point out that that's what that actually says already. Mm -hmm. It says right. uh, they wouldn't guardrail or other hardscape feature. Right, but I just want to check to make sure with the applicant that that the understands that your your issue wasn't with the comment in entirety. It was just making no. sure that it wasn't the wooden guard layer that we're comfortable with the boulder. Is that correct? Correct. In fact, I I would, if at all possible, just to describe that the hardscape feature between the parking area and parking as other hardscape feature. Just take out the wooden guardrail. Yes, please. That was the only request. There's no issue with the intention. Okay. And then the dimming of the lights. Um, now, dimming lights, it's not necessarily shutting them off. It's just taking them down a level. Uh, do you have concerns at night over there with activity that makes you want to keep them on and brighter than necessary? Or? Well, I have concerns that, you know, if, if it's dimmed, it'll remove a perception of safety that people feel when they have bright lights. Um, you know, again, we have shields on them so they're not into other people's, you know, um, windows and stuff, but I, I just don't feel comfortable being required to dim them. Um, you know, when, you know, for people's own houses, that's a choice. We're providing safety for 38 residents and, you know, people's perception in their apartments, they want their parking lots to be fairly well lit. Staff, uh, can I just clarify, is this just a good practice or ordinance. No ordinance related? Um, the ordinance does, you know, suggest to dimming of lights on properties that are on up for site plan review. Um, but, you know, staff certainly staff. understands the uh, applicants concerns. So I, I'd say it's up to the board on this one. Thank you. Can I uh, have each board member just weigh in on whether or not they should be dimmed? Rick, since you're, well, I'd, you're our I'd, lighting guy. I'd like to see the applicant uh, present a photometrics to the staff and ensure <laughs> levels are before we say, no, you can't dim. I mean, uh, we don't know what, what fixtures are going in there uh, and what the photometric spread is going to be for those. So I would ask that maybe they work with staff, but our ordinance does does say that uh, where possible they should be dimmed um, and uh, I, I think I'd be more comfortable with you know working with the staff to make sure that uh, yes safety is is a concern but also 
um, energy and, um, you know, night sky lighting. Um, if I may. Sure, Steve. Um, again, this is an existing apartment complex with existing light poles. We're, I kind of can let you know how many we're proposed adding, but th we're using the same exact fixture that we currently use down there. They're all LED lights, very high efficiency. Um, I, I, you know, I believe me, I'm when I, I'd rather not pay to have lights on, but it's it's a requirement in you know apartment complexes. So, um, but again, we're not really uh, uh, adding a lot of lighting to the site. Um, and is this, you know, are we talking about the entire site or just the uh, the additional um, lights? So if we could. Roger. Yes. Um, what, what, so currently, uh, Steve, you don't dim the lights. Is that correct? That is correct. We don't do not. Okay. And according to staff, all you're doing, you, what you're doing is re relocating three existing lights. Correct. You're not adding any more lights. Correct. Is that correct? Correct. I'm inclined to just. It, Leave, leave it the way it is. I mean, it's, it's working now and I mean, I, I don't see why, you know, uh, I have a lot of respect for Rick, Rick and his, um, his expertise on this, but I, 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 I tend to agree with the applicant in terms of why incur the existing, I mean, you know, additional cost because we're not adding more lights. Can, can but, I ask, um, through the chair. Yes, go ahead, Angela. I ask, maybe to have Kylie maybe clarify because um, there are three fixtures new shown here. One in particular is within, looks like 15 or 20 feet from the property line. So maybe that's the one that might be a concern for Rick. And have you guys looked at that and how that kind of plays into the abutting properties? Sure, so I kind of answer that actually. Um, let me share my screen really quickly. Um, oh, I cannot. So, um, so they are actually the three existing fi uh, light fixtures that we're relocating. So if I were to pull them up here, you could actually see that these are existing light fixtures uh, that we'll be relocating. You can see them on the survey on sheet two um, of six of your packet. Um, we'll be just relocating the existing fixtures. One of the things that's very interesting is that um, the property, the actual abutting property, is a strip of land that was conveyed by this landowner, by Meadowoods LLC, to the town of Scarborough. So it is not actually abutting any residential neighborhood. There is a strip of land in between here that has been conveyed out already to the town of Scarborough. Um, so there is no concern of light intrusion into the residential property. So we did look at that. Um, and again, they are existing fixtures with house side shields. Um, and we, we did not see any concerns initially um, of light intrusion. Thanks, Kylie. It's helpful. Uh, Rachel. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm kind of with Rick. Um, they may be the same light fixtures, but uh, they they are being relocated. I notice on the proposed uh, motion, you have a lighting plan and cut sheets of the existing light fixtures to be relocated. Uh, I assume that that's not a problem. No, nope. we have the cut sheets. Uh, we're happy to provide photometrics. I think the issue is just, and I'll use my own office as an example. For example, there are no lights in that parking lot on right now. And when I leave here, my perception of safety is gonna be very different leaving my office to go to my car this evening. And so and, I would and, just state it that way. And I, I, I understand that um, and we're talking that the lights be dimmed at some point, not turned off. Um, so I understand uh, your concern about safety, but I, I'm i not clear uh, about the concern about dimming the lights at a certain time. Uh, other apartments have that dimming. Um, we've required that and it is suggested. Um, it actually probably saves money uh, rather than keeping the lights on full force. So I'm, I'm unclear about, about the concern and um, I, 
I'm with Rick uh, that we, we need some dimming. Thanks, Rachel. Jennifer? There we go. Um, can, uh, I just have a question about what percentage of, so obviously the plans that are submitted um, are with regard to this parking lot expansion. And then on the cover sheet, you sort of have an overall view. Um, it looks like there's three or four other buildings as part of the complex that aren't necessarily shown because they're not as close to the parking lot expansion. But I'm just curious in terms of like maybe percentage wise, how many light fixtures, how many of these type of light fixtures do you have on the site overall? Um, and so if three of them are being moved, is that half of the light on the light fixtures on the site? Is it 10%? Um, I think off the top of my head, I think there's 16 light poles throughout the property. Those include, you know, there's one along the road by the entrance to uh, Gorm Road. Um, there's a park, a small little parking lot when you first come in. I believe there's two in that parking lot. Um, and there's another small parking lot that has maybe three in it. Um, this one, which would be a little further away from the buildings, I, again, part of the reason we'll, we'd like to keep it better lit. Again, you know, dimming parking lots, uh, that's just a very, I, I know the reasoning behind it, you know, from where the board, some board members are coming from, but I, I, I think you're dictating other people's safety and, I, and I'm, it makes me very concerned. Um, you know, again, it has the proper shield. So, you know, light spillage onto other properties just isn't an issue here. Um, and I find, you know, I find it's very uncomforting to me. What other property owners choose to do, that's their concern. But I think it's, you know, where you have um, vulnerable populations living, you know, I don't think it makes sense. People work late shifts, come home, um, and you have dim parking lots. That's not a, you know, as Kylie mentioned, leaving um, a building or coming to a building when the lights are dim in the parking lot is not a comforting feeling. I'm just not really comfortable. And being so it needs to be dim. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, and so just a clarification because we don't have it open in front of me, is there ordinance language that limp the lights have to be dimmed or that it's uh, at the discretion of somebody else? Yeah, I can answer that question, Jen. Um, Nick, if it's okay. Um, it, it suggested that they that we use timers or something to that effect. I think one of the questions really is um, my, you know, I haven't seen the photometrics plan. I don't know that staff seen a photometrics plan. So I think it goes really back to Rick's initial comment. Rick Mineking's initial comment is without knowing how bright this parking lot is, maybe, you know, maybe once we see a photometrics plan and understand what the what the fixtures are. You know, I think we, we certainly hear that the concern about safety and not, you know, we understand about going completely dark. That's, I don't think, the, the question for this application. It's really about what is the right level. Um, and maybe the level they have is, you know, already at a, at a low enough level. It's, it's the unknown right now, I guess, is really more the issue rather than, again, we completely hear and understand uh, Mr. Bird's concern about you know, the residents he has living in his um, complex. That makes total sense, certainly. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, I guess then without uh, seeing those photometrics, um, I would maybe defer to, to staff in that case, if that's the way that this is going. So if photometrics are going to be submitted, um, to the staff at a later date. Um, I can't quite see that. Uh, yeah, I, I think that as written, that's fine. And um, if there's an issue beyond that, I would, um, you know, trust that staff would bring it to the board if necessary. But generally, um, the comments about you know understanding where the start level is and then 
um, <clears throat> having a discussion from there about both site usage and um, you know other environmental concerns in terms of lighting. If I could jump in, I just threw just edited condition one B. It's not doesn't need to be read that way, but I just wanted to throw that out there as maybe a possible solution, Mr. Chair and board. Yeah, I, I appreciate that because I think here we, we should offer a little flexibility um, given the applicant's concerns um, and, and and take them into account. I think the cut sheets are, are going to help you out when you have a chance to look at it. Additionally, um, I'd like to note that F just says you want a plan note indicating what time the, the lights will be dimmed. It doesn't really clarify whether it's a tenth of a lumen. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't say it was at three. 3 a.m. I think a lot of ability with the way this is written here to kind of try to work this out with staff uh, once they see the cut sheets. Is that, is that fair? That's fine with me. All right, great. Uh, so with that said, uh, uh, Kylie, are you all set here looking at the rest of these? Um, That's great. No Thank you so much. You've got you've been very generous with with your comments and time. Right. So with that, uh, if you could scroll up a little bit for me. Thank you. I will move to the site plan amendment titled Meadowwoods Parking Expansion as depicted on the plan set prepared by Sebago Technics dated 92520 with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings, the applicant is proposing to expand the existing parking area on the property by 11 spaces. It also includes landscaping and stormwater management provisions. The property is located at 62 Gorm Road and will utilize existing frontage. The property is located within the residential R4 zoning district. The planning board has reviewed the application and supporting documentation design of the site plan adequately addresses the site plan review and zoning ordinance requirements for the site utilization and layout access internal vehicular movement parking pedestrian ways landscaping stormwater management lighting architecture signage utilities and storage waivers one for most parking aisle width of 22 feet conditions one prior to issuance of a building permit the applicant shall revise the plan set to include a additional landscaping provisions within the western parking lot island b a lighting plan and cut sheets of the existing light fixture the applicant and staff shall coordinate on whether dimming on the site is appropriate. C, snow storage area. D, a dimension for the easterly parking side. E, hardscape feature between the parking area and the proposed under drain soil filter. I'm sorry, F, the standard site plan note. This shall be approved and approved, reviewed and approved by the planning department. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall A, address the civil peer review comments in the memo data. Uh, memo from Woodard and Grant 2220. Three, prior to, I'm sorry, B, to coordinate, continue to coordinate with the town with regards to a formal connection, emergency pedestrian, et cetera, in the future to the school property to the west as discussed with the planning board. Prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That's the motion, do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Rick. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call roll. Rick Meinking. Yes. Jennifer Ladd. Yes. Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Roger Beely. Yes. Nick McGee, yes. I'm sure that is 5-0. Congratulations, good luck. Thank Thanks you so much. much. Have a great evening. See you soon. You too. Next item on tonight's agenda is Thomas Gary Uppy and Bethany uh, France Brannon request a subdivision amendment review for the Riverwood Assessor's Map R3 lots 1732 and 1733. I, uh, I as chair, am going to recuse myself from this discussion. This is a neighbor and friend of mine. So I will turn the rest of the, the uh, I, uh, Rachel to run for, the, for this part. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Jamel. Thank you. Um, so this project's in the RF zoning district within the western portion of town. Uh, the applicant's proposing to reconfigure the common property line of lots 32 and 33 within the existing subdivision in order to correct an existing property encroachment due to the construction of a shed and fence. So the applicant has also indicated that they placed a shed within the 25-foot wetland buffer as depicted on the approved subdiv subdivision plans. 
and reviewing the public file here in the office, uh, the site is subject to a main DEP permit, which identifies a 25 foot wetland setback requirement. Staff suggests that the applicant update the board on any correspondence to date with DEP as the wetland setback and buffer is a condition of the existing approval uh, for the subdivision. Staff has also noted that it appears that the location of the shed will not meet the required 15 foot side yard setback based on the delineation provided on the plans. So staff is not connected with the applicant uh, in regards to the existing uh, DEP permit. Um, so final action should not be taken by the board uh, this evening until correspondence from DEP is provided. Turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Chair, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jamel, and for the applicant. Thomas, is that, uh, are you doing it for the applicant? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, in your discussion, could you please uh, talk about the status of the uh, any main DEP conversations? I've made a couple of I had to contact them a couple of times and have got no response on the on-call status people there. Um, I really did think it was a DEP issue, is it? I'm sorry, there's, there's kind of a hiccup. You your, uh... Do you want me to jump in, Rachel? Yeah, I, I'm hearing a, a, some feedback and a hiccup there. Go ahead. Sure. So, yeah, staff did review the file here in the planning can department. Can you hear me? And um, the, the existing subdivision was approved uh, by the main DEP. And in the permit, it requires a 25 foot uh, wetland setback, um, which the shed is actually encroaching on. So, that's what we're noting on. So, it, that would require an amendment to the existing DEP permit. All right. as, as we understand it. But it was my understanding that the, the 25 foot setback is more of a local zoning ordinance than a DEP uh, issue. Uh, Jamel, can you respond? Um, it's it's stated in the in the permit. So um, that's something that we don't have any control over in terms of that condition of approval from the state. Okay, I, I, will, I will follow through with that too. You know, we'll get a re resolution from the uh, DEP in regards to that issue. All right, thank you. Is there anything else that you want to uh, mention to us? Well, the only other thing is that I'm not sure uh, what you have from, you've only got the package that we submitted and since then we have had the property redelineated uh, by Mark Hampton who did the original delineation. And the findings was that it reduced the impact of the buffer down to like 2.9 feet of the shed being in there, not the point shed is shown. Um, and the other re comment regarding the setback, um, we're looking at a 16 foot setback around that shed. Not, it's pretty hard to tell with the scale of that to uh, get it correct, but I'm gonna show you at 16 feet. I can show you my screen and show you exactly that if you'd like to see it. Yes, I, I think the board would, thank you. Uh, Jamel, can you help him share screen? Are you able to share, uh, Tom? Yeah. Give us a second here. How's that look? Uh, upside down, but yes, okay. As you can see, the green line is the 15 foot setback. And I, I actually went 16 foot around the shed to make sure that we didn't need the setback there. All right, thank you. And would you like to see the wetland impact? Yes, please. And once again, here's the wetland impact. The new line running through, we're, we're looking at 2.9 feet, that corner of the shed that is shaded, about eight and a half feet up the shed line, about 13 square feet total inside that buffer. All right, thank you. Uh, this is subject to a public hearing. Is there anyone in the public uh, who would like to comment? Please hit the raise your hand button on your screen. And Jamel, I hope you can keep track of who's raising their hands. I am taking a look for you, uh, you, Madam Chair, and I'm not seeing anyone as of yet. 
All right, we'll give them another 15, 20 seconds and uh, move on. All right, here no hearing no comments, uh, no public comments. Let's go to the board. Um, Jen, would you begin with this? Um, so do I understand correctly that we do not have the ability to waive even a 2.9 foot um, in infringement on the 25 foot DEP buffer? So it's really a matter of, um, it's not so much of whether you have the ability to waive or not, it's the, it's the statement from the DEP permit. So it's okay. really, it, it's not a local requirement. So it, one of the things that the board would be asked to amend is on the local subdivision plan, it requires 25 foot setback. So that was something that the planning board at the time of this application had no recorded on the plan. So that that's what our local amendment would be. But I think that the standing question is, and I think, you know, it might've been mentioned, you know, this was a precursor to our conservation subdivision. You know, this was approved under sort of this precursor language that didn't have that sort of strict 25 foot setback that we have today, um, but it did sort of set up around wetlands protections and buffers for um, other open space, you know. Um, so again, I think, you know, the, the primary question is really how's the DEP going to um, react, um, I think, Barring, barring a DEP decision was certainly, I think, given the modest uh, um, um, modifications they're looking for, probably, um, you know, inform any local decision, but. Okay, so um, DEP will or should weigh in on, um, whether or not this constitutes an amendment to the overall um, permit for this site. And then based on that, we would either, we would just tailor any approval from the board accordingly. Is that right? Certainly could. Um, again, you know, it's, yeah, I think that's probably about right again the board would, would need to make a local decision on the on the request but um can i speak can you hear me uh please go ahead thomas um we've we've looked at moving the shed and trying to alleviate this issue but we're looking at approximately seven to ten thousand dollars just to move it that little bit due to the plumbing the electricity and everything that's in the infrastructure tied into the pool with that um we will contact DEP. Um, I'm hoping that this doesn't affect our ability to at least get the property lines taken care of because we've, this is quite a dynamic project trying to get releases from neighbors, mortgage companies, things of that nature, and just trying to keep this ball rolling along. Um, that, that's where we're at there. I mean, if worse comes to worse, we're gonna end up moving the shed. But I mean, I would have thought that 2.9 feet, but I don't think we're asking for very much. If you'd like us to go to DEP, I will do that route, but uh, I don't know how much time and effort we want to spend with that. I, I believe uh, I believe what I'm hearing from Jay is that um, uh, the you actually do need to approach the DEP. Is that correct, Jay? Again, this is part of the standing DEP site law or stormwater permit, I think is actually a site law permit. Again, forgive me, I don't have the file right in front of me, but I believe it's part of their site law permit for the overall subdivision. Um, and again, typically, you know, our, our subdivision ordinance talks about having state and local agencies signed off before making decisions. Um, and I do think, you know, one of the things that would be Difficult if this board made a decision um, and had a recorded plan that was in contrary to a standing state agency permit, that then we have a standing conflict that would probably be more complex than the issue that's before us today. So 
Um, I think that's where staff's comments, Jamel's comments about having DEP weigh in um, to help inform a local decision is really probably the, as far as staff sees it, the, the correct steps. All right, we appreciate uh, that. Uh, so what that would mean then is that there are actually two issues remaining before the, the planning board. And the first is uh, whether the uh, new delineation showing a 16 foot set, setback uh, takes care of the required 15 foot side yard setback um, requirements um, and whether we're satisfied that that does meet those requirements. And that uh, we also, uh, I believe, uh, agree that the uh, property lines are re have may be reconfigured as they're shown in the plan. Is that uh, your understanding, Jay? And what's left? Trying to find my mute button. Um, yeah, so it does appear that they've now indicated clearly that they're going to meet that standard 15 foot setback. That's a minimum, you know, space and bulk requirement that, you know, the board has no, no discretion with. So that's good that they've been able to address that issue. So again, I think it boils down to that primary question. And do we need to um, weigh in on the new lot configuration? That appears to be uh, fine. All the lots would meet the requirements with the reconfiguration as proposed. All right. Um, does the board have any other questions? Any questions from the other board members? Roger? Well, yes, uh, to the applicant. When, when did you submit the um, request to the DEP? Uh, I've called them a couple of times. Um, randomly, I'm gonna say, as soon as I received the notification from uh, staff addressing that, I, that's when I started making the phone calls. I have not reached out to them in a, the past few days. Uh, it's been like once a week trying to get a hold of whoever's on staff, but the COVID thing has really hit DEP pretty hard. They're all working from home. Um, and it's hot luck. Yeah, that's what I... I just so so basically just recently then you've been trying to reach them ever since I got the recent staff review comments. So oh, okay. I this was a DDP issue myself. So it sounds to me like we we were our hands are kind of tied until um, we get a clarification from DEP then. Are we only tied in regards to the with the location of the building? I mean, can we get approval for the lot line configuration? And if DEP says we have to move the building, we move the building and we're in compliance. I guess what we're trying to do is not move the building. Uh, but, if, you know, if we have to move the building, I guess we're going to have to move the building. Yeah. And, and we're talking about just that one corner of the building that would infringe. Yeah, it. One little corner. I can show you that picture again. It's not much. It's 12 square feet, 13 square feet tops. That area right there. Yeah. The shaded area. Correct. Yeah. Um, if I could cut it off, and I, I know Tom would probably cut it off, but there's just too much infrastructure underneath there with electrical. That's right where the electrical panel is. <laughs> well, all right. Uh, let me let me, uh, let me ask uh, Jay: um, Is it possible to bifurcate this? We have a submission that essentially contains three elements of, of review. We cannot come up with a final. Uh, a final decision until we hear from the DEP. Uh, I, it appears, and we can take a vote if we need to, that the board is satisfied that the 15-foot uh, setback requirement has been met. Uh, I have not heard any objections to the change in the lot lines. Uh, it simply remains uh, in the hands of the DEP. Is there any action that we can take tonight uh, to allow the um, homeowner, uh, property owner, to go forward with whatever settlement he may need to do in terms of lot lines. Yeah, I do think you know you you, break, you raise a good point that you could bifurcate, as you uh, so aptly put it, the question um, because currently the shed is in violation. It's one across a property line and 
and within that 25 foot buffer. The request of the applicant um, and to, you know, of, of the applicant to the board was really twofold, was about the lot line adjustment and the 25 foot wetland setback. If they're saying at this point, we withdraw the 25 foot wetland setback question and really are just looking for the lot line adjustment. Um, certainly, I think the board could make the motion to approve the lot reconfiguration and leave the 25 foot wetland buffer as it is on the plans. And then that would, um, the, the, the same uh, uh, violation um, of that condition would be in place, you know, this would just be around the wetland. Um, and essentially we could, working with the applicant sort of get, get something on record that, look, we know we have a standing violation work through your DEP process, you know, we got to correct it, right? And so we can work to a corrective measure if they're able to get a DEP approval um, to reduce that 25 foot wetland setback, they could come back to this board for re that request alone. Um, if DEP says no way, well then, you know, they'll need to deal with uh, corrective measures however they deal with that. So um, I do think the board could deal with just the question of the lot configuration, I think, Again, uh, so staff would have to go back and look at the plans that have been submitted. We may, may need to revise that the plan that's been submitted, um, just given some of the notes that are probably on there and clarity of record are really around what's being um, approved. Because again, really the two questions were intertwined on the application, I think in the notes on the plans. Um, but the board's comfortable with just, again, the lot reconfiguration. That's certainly something you could deal with this evening and leave the question of the the wetland setback buffer um, for a future future uh, deliberation. Um, uh, Roger, just just a moment. Let me uh, ask the uh, application applicant if that process or procedure would be helpful, or do you want to come back with everything at the same time? I think that on our half, I think that'd be helpful to keep the other parts of this project moving along and regarding getting releases from mortgage companies and things of that nature. Uh, my only question is, is if we do go through DEP and they say you're okay there, I guess we could come back to the board and say, this is what they said. And we would ask for your permission to leave the shed there. But if they say that, no, they're not going to allow us to put it there. We're going to, it, we seem like we're going to move the shed enough to get it out of that buffer. Is that something that has to be brought back to the board? Is that something that we can handle with Brian and codes itself? That, if, if you don't mind, Rachel. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so if you're going to move it out of the 25 foot setback, that would be just dealing with our code enforcement office. You would, you know, again, presuming the board approves the lot reconfiguration tonight, then I would say there'd be no further action with this board. The only further action with this board would be if you choose to remain within that wetland setback um, buffer. And again, just to be clear, we aren't actually impacting the wetland itself. It's the buffer. Um, then you know should DEP approve it and you wish to maintain the shed right where it is then you would come back to the board for that sort of singular question um, so. right uh, Roger yeah I was actually that's exactly what the point I was going to make if the DEP comes back and say that says they cannot do this you may end up relocating you'll have to relocate the shed and if you relocate the shed you may actually may not even need that additional land. Is that possible also? No, uh, not really. If you look at the prior lot lines, that, that lot line is going right through the middle of the shed. Uh, that line right there, here is the existing lot line. Uh, to move that shed that much, it's not really feasible. Um, it just, the way the, the, the trees are cut around here, it, it, Tom put it in the best spot he possibly could. Um, now, and we're going to have to purchase the land to get this lot lines fixed to keep the shed as close as we can to where it is. I think if worse comes to worse, we're going to end up just kicking out that left corner, this corner here, and pulling this shed forward. But we're going to have to disconnect all the you know, utilities going to it first. It's, it's going to be some work, but we're hoping to keep it there. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at DEP, but I would like to try to get the lot line issue taken care of tonight. Oh, okay. 
All right. Um, if there are no objections from the board members, um, Jamel, could you write up something that we can, uh, some sort of uh, motion that we can pass or Jay? I uh, have been trying my hardest to write something that makes sense on the spot. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and Jay and Angela and the board just uh, feel free to tell me it doesn't make sense. Give me a minute. <laughs> you guys read it okay? Take your time. Uh, looks reasonable to me, uh, the applicant. If um, if there are no uh, edits or complaints, and this is acceptable. Hold on just a second, let me just read that. Under your conditions, uh, one comment would be, Provide documentation from Maine DEP indicating that the location of the shed meets their requirements. Um, I think we know right now the 25 foot requirement is, is not met, but if they're good with the location with the 2.9 foot encroachment into that buffer, are we going to maintain, be able to maintain the shed where it is? Yeah, that's what the condition is. That's, that's what it aims to, to say. Uh, basically, if we receive um uh, you know documentation from them that they're okay with it um we can stick that in the file just so in the future um if you sell the property or or, or not um it's just clear in the record that dep did approve it okay is that something that we need to come back to the board or is that just something that we can handle with uh codes regarding getting that letter put in if, if it's in our favor so I guess I, I, I would just chime in that unless the board, so this is where I think it gets a little tricky because we need to take a look at what the, the re, what the recorded plan is going to say, right? Right now we have a recorded plan that requires a 25 foot setback. So unless this board is willing to approve, yeah, I think there any reduction of that 25 foot setback would have to come back to this board for further consideration unless the board's willing to approve that tonight. Um, but I think part of the discussion has been around the fact that we wanna see and understand um, the DEP's requirements around that before making that approval. So, you know, I do, I do feel there's probably gonna need to be some plan modification at, um, from what was submitted just to clarify what what you know that that really at this point the board's only approving the lot line reconfiguration i would almost say that the plan should pull the shed completely off and just have the recorded plan be very clear about really the recorded plan is demonstrating what the lot ownership is and what the lot division is the shed violation is a separate and distinct issue outside of this board's discussions so far tonight, at least as so far as we've bifurcated the question. So um, I do think we will need to have before the plan, before this board signs the plan. So just um, for, for the applicant's benefit, once the board makes an approval, um, they still need to sign a plan and that plan needs to get recorded at the registry of deeds. So I do think that there'll need to be some modifications to that plan that um, without spending a lot of time sort of working through the uh, sausage making process of looking at all the notes on the plan tonight, uh, that staff can certainly work with the applicant um, in the coming days and weeks um, to get that 
those plan notes revised and then get that before the board for signature, which can be done outside of a meeting. Uh, once the board's taken their action, we can the board typically signs plans outside of a meeting uh, once conditions are met. So um, I hope that's providing some level of clarity. Yeah, Jamel, I, I think um, some of Jay's language needs to be included on that in terms of uh, the applicant working with the planning staff. Uh, Jay, can you help me out here? Uh, let's see, uh, maybe just add to the end of that sentence, uh, plan to be reviewed uh, and approved by planning department staff prior to signature by the planning board, something to that effect. I know the English teacher, Ms. Hendrickson, is biting her tongue. I'm, I'm, I'm checking for the things, I'm just, but, uh, checking uh, hopefully the she's going to get Checking for the commas, the spelling, and stuff like that. It's on the spot. <laughs> Not How bad. does that look? Uh, it looks, uh, it looks uh, appropriately bureaucratic, so I think um, <laughs> okay. at the applicant is. Uh, if this is acceptable to the applicant, we can move forward with this part. Uh, so we have uh, a draft motion, Riverwood Subdivision, Subdivision Amendment 3. I move to approve the project titled Third Amendment Subdivision Plan of Riverwoods, proposed by Thomas Garropy and Bethany Brannon, as depicted on the plan set prepared by Bess, dated 10-5-20, with the following findings and conditions. Findings, the proposed third amended subdivision plan includes the reconfiguration of the common property line of lots 32 and 33. The subdivision is located within the RF zoning district and is further identified on the town of Scarborough tax map as map R3, lots 1732 and 1733. Conditions. One, the existing shed on the property encroaches on the required 25 foot wetland buffer as identified on the main DEP permit for the project. The location of the shed is in violation of the main DEP permit for the subdivision. The applicant shall provide documentation from main DEP indicating that the location of the shed meets their requirements or relocate the shed outside of the wetland buffer. Two, the subdivision plan shall be modified in accordance with the planning board's deliberation. The plan shall be reviewed and approved by the planning department prior to the signing of the subdivision plan for recording. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, yeah, seconded by Jen. Um, let's do a roll call. Uh, Roger Bealey? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rich Meinking? Yes. Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. And note that Nick McGee has recused himself from this. Uh, this has passed unanimously. Um, I hope uh, this enables you to move forward. Uh, and we will see you, or the planning staff will, will see you as, as you get you start to get this resolved with the uh, DEP. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, right. Rachel. And we Excellent have... job, by the way. Hmm? I'm going to take more time off. <laughs> <laughs> we now turn this back to Mr. McGee. All right. Next item on tonight's agenda is the Gables LLC requests a preliminary subdivision and site plan review for lot two, the town center residential subdivision with the Downs, Assessors Matthew 39, lot two. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is located on the CPD zoning district, uh, lot two of the town center residential neighborhood subdivision at the Downs along Scarborough Downs Road. The applicant's proposing to construct uh, two 4,513 square foot, three-story, 12-unit residential condominium buildings and one 2,400 square foot, three-story, six-unit residential condominium building. The proposal also includes uh, two parking garages that will consist of 16 enclosed parking spaces at the rear of the property. Uh, so staff did note that the applicants proposing a total of 67 off street parking spaces for the project. And we did suggest that the applicant consider uh, eliminating 
uh, the six proposed spaces in the parking bank adjacent to the site entrance, given that 15 spa 57 spaces are required for the project. Staff did also recommend the applicant uh, consider installing a raised crosswalk uh, adjacent to the parking garages, given the straight parking lot layout and the potential site conflicts, uh, given the locations of the garages. And staff also noted that there appears to be an opportunity for additional planting within the, within the southerly portion of the site to help create some more visual interest and buffering between the property and the existing uh, property uh, south of the project within the existing enterprise business park development. And I think at this point, Angela is going to speak to a few comments about the easements on the property. Um, thanks. I just wanted to clarify, I think more so for the applicant, because I know um, the designer and myself uh, went through um, Quite a lot of a back and forth during subdivision. Really, my focus is on making sure there's access to the stormwater BMPs and the outfalls associated with them so that they can be maintained in the future. And so it's just looking for a little bit of clarity, um, which I know that, as I said, Goral Palmer is aware um, of that concern and trying to get access to those locations and making sure I, that maybe staff understands a little better about whether we are proposing to amend the easements that were associated with the subdivision or if additional easements will be provided now that we know the layout for that site um, before it was a blank slate. So we were just kind of guessing at some locations for easements and access points now that the buildings are being cited and parking lot is being formed around it. Um, trying to figure out is, is that just additional easements or is that modifying our previous approvals through subdivision? That's it. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Dan Bacon here on behalf of um, the Gables LLC. And, and I also like other applicants wanna thank the board for all the time that you're spending in this extra meeting. Um, it's super helpful. I know I know the hours you're putting in. So um, we're very appreciative and I'll try to be short and sweet while also uh, answering all the uh, staff's questions and presenting uh, the, uh, the site pretty efficiently here. I'm gonna quickly share my screen. And um, as Jamal introduced, just to orient everybody quickly, uh, lot two where the Gables is proposed is um, part of the town center residential subdivision um, that you reviewed over the course of the spring. This is the remaining lot um, in this subdivision. It's essentially across from Front Runner Way along the Downs Road. It's the only lot on the, on the, um, the west side of the Downs Road, which is now well under construction. As the board likely remembers, um, as part of subdivision approval, we got um, all the kind of the utility approvals, the DEP approval. Um, so the, the lot is kind of other than site planning and the things that Angela mentioned uh, that Drew will jump in on, um, essentially approved with those other agencies for development. And uh, at your last meeting um, a week ago, this is this lot was also included in the um, the interim uh, traffic study. So there's there's traffic permitting that's available for this lot as the board was uh, nice to provide that approval uh, last week. So in terms of uh, lot specifics, as Jamal indicated, there's three buildings proposed um, consistent with the zoning and the master plan, and we've oriented them oriented them along the Downs Road. So very similar to the Tandem Court project that you saw over the summer. There's two 12 unit buildings, one six unit building. We've oriented them up towards the street um, for kind of that, that street wall, for that walkable uh, layout um, and along the sidewalk. So there's sidewalk connections from the building uh, frontages and then there's uh, there's also uh, connections to the parking that we've located to the rear. Um, we've designed the, the one driveway into the site on the northerly end of the site um, with proper separation from Daisy Cutter Lane, which is the closest curb cut um, just south on the Downs Road. And 
as provides access um, that we reviewed with the fire department uh, from that driveway. And we have kind of a front parking area uh, between the garages and the buildings with uncovered parking um, close to the buildings. And then we have essentially double loaded uh, garages. So you, you can access garages on the front side. Then there's a drive that goes around uh, to the rear of the site to access uh, the other garage bays. And there's a total of uh, 32 uh, covered spaces and the, the remaining um, uncovered spaces. Jamal mentioned, uh, I think these parking, these six parking spaces here is kind of being more than the ordinance requires. Um, we, we actually like the layout and the fact that there is some, a little bit additional parking than, than the ordinance minimums. Um, we envision these to be kind of more extra parking, guest parking that can be um, on the site. And we find that having a little bit of extra uh, works well for these complexes um, and then not relying just on the on-street parking for some guest parking. So we the, the on-street parking along the Downs Road, we believe will really be shared in the whole neighborhood. It isn't gonna necessarily be exclusive to, um, to this site. So having some extra on-street excuse me, off-street parking is, is important, to, important to the project. In terms of the overall uh, impervious cover on this lot, um, we're about at 50, 53% um, impervious cover. The ordinance uh, maximum is, is 75%. So we're, we're well under kind of the, the lot coverage and, and would like to have that additional kind of parking area. Um, in addition to that, uh, Jamal mentioned this, this walkway um, and we have a crosswalk here that connects. This is really intended to connect um, folks parking on the back side of the garages and they, they would walk down the drive and then have this, this sidewalk and then a crosswalk to tie into the units. Um, this site layout is very similar to Tandem Court and, and many others where uh, there isn't a lot of kind of through traffic you know, it's just residents this is a condo project so owners are going to be living here um in the peak hour there's you know 13 to 16 cars per hour kind of moving through the parking lot um, per our traffic estimates so it's going to be a pretty low volume uh, drive aisle we are asking for for a waiver to go from 25 foot wide drive aisle to the 24 um, like we've been doing on a number of other sites so I think traffic's going to be fairly minimal and, and driving through very slow. So we prefer not to raise a crosswalk in this context for, for those reasons, maintenance reasons, kind of noise reasons, um, driving up and over a raised crosswalk. Um, and we think it's going to be quite safe. So um, we'd prefer not to do that in that location um, and, and do other things to, to make sure people are driving through in a safe manner. Um, in addition to kind of those points, um, Angela mentioned access to an easement uh, to the stormwater outfalls and BMPs. Um, we have laid this out, actually provide pretty good access. In the rear here is uh, stormwater um, BMP that the drive aisle is going to provide um, good access to. There is an easement in this location here um, to provide access to that in uh, emergency, emergency situations for the town. There's also an easement along here. I think both of those are per the subdivision plans already, so they're, they're not adjusting those easements. Um, and Drew can jump in it after I'm done to correct me if I'm misstating. Um, so these easements are kind of per the approved subdivision plan to provide access to this BMP and also to this outfall. Um, and Angela, if you have more specific questions, I know Drew can answer those. The one easement that, that is changing location from the subdivision plan um, is through the center of the site. So we contemplated that perhaps the layout of, the, of this site would have a, a driveway that would line up with Daisy Cutter to create a four-way intersection. So we initially provided an easement in this location um, that we're eliminating um, because of this layout, the building being here and the driveway shifting over here. So there is a shift in 
that easement to go in this location um, instead of here. If that if that helps. And Drew, maybe at this point you can chime in to to correct me if I misstated anything. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, Drew Gagnon with Coral Palmer. No, you said it just about right. So we really have a combination of the existing easements that are on this site and we're adding to them. Um, and like Dan mentioned, we're just moving the, the simple access easement to where the actual access drive is and to give the town rights to get around the site and to the stormwater BMPs. So the infrastructure and the stormwater management ponds all have existing drainage and maintenance easements. It's just simply the access to get there, which is what we have discussed um, during the subdivision approvals. We weren't exactly sure where the, where this lot was gonna lay out during that time. And at this time, all we're, all we're proposing is moving the, the, um, the access easement to get to these stormwater BMPs and still providing um, all the other easements that are for infrastructure that's in the ground. Thanks, Drew. And uh, we can clarify if there's questions during board discussion, staff questions. Um, this plan is the utility plan. As I mentioned, the utilities um, were generally laid out as part of the overall subdivision plan. Since that time, um, we've gotten Portland Water District approval uh, to provide public water uh, service to, the, to these three buildings. Um, we also have the sanitary district approval in place um, for this entire site and the flows, uh, the wastewater flows for, for the site. Uh, in terms of a landscaping plan, we have a robust landscaping plan that provides, that really kind of complements the, the town center residential subdivision uh, landscaping plan with street trees um, along the Downs Road. And we've um, provided additional plantings around each building, um, some trees around the parking area. Staff did mention, you know, potentially providing a, a bit more buffer to um, the adjacent site and enterprise, the veterinary clinic, which is just off the screen here, uh, this lot here. So we can work with staff on, on locating um, some additional buffering there while also making sure we, we don't infringe on this, this easement here, there is a uh, stormwater pipe that connects the Downs Road um, and lot one in the project to this stormwater BMP. So I, I think we can accommodate that and kind of thread the needle on providing it some additional uh, plantings in that location. Um, but otherwise, this is the overall planting plan. Um, and uh, we're using similar architecture to uh, Tandem Court uh, with a different slightly different color scheme. We're doing sort of a charcoal gray buildings with uh, the Brunswick um, darker gray, if you will, and the central elements of the larger buildings um, to, to have really a transition from tandem court to uh, the other areas of the project to Hayloft apartments and provide uh, similar architecture and look um, in the same kind of family. So this gives you a sense of the perspective from the Downs Road um, and the, uh, the overall aesthetic along the street and in the buildings kind of look and feel. Um, so that's, that's trying to be brief. That's, that's our presentation for this evening on, on lot two in the Gables. Uh, this is both a subdivision and a site plan. Um, so it's a two-step process um, being a subdivision, uh, given the, the number of dwelling units in the project. So uh, this evening we're requesting preliminary approval so we can um, continue on towards a final and certainly would like to work with staff on addressing some any final details um, prior to the final submission, final approval, and also hear, hear any board comments and, and address your comments to, to the best of our ability. So. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, for questions. Thanks, Dan, appreciate it. Uh, if you were here in attendance this evening and would like to speak on this project, please use the raise my hand feature in the bottom right-hand corner of your app. All right, seeing none, I'm gonna turn this over to the board. I gotta, I'll stop a little bit here. Uh, Angela, the first thing I want to know is whether or not um, 
the explanations that you received on the easements and the clarifications um, helped with some of your con concerns and um, with what you're seeing. Yeah, I think um, it'd be good to see, I guess, a written response and then showing where that additional easement is in the back. I think it's also part of the comment was about making sure like the master homeowners association has who is going to be the ones maintaining it. So it's not necessarily just the town, which it's great. Um, the town has some um, access rights in case the road, which we will potentially own in the future, starts having um, drainage issues that we can get in there in an emergency situation, but also making sure you have um, and I don't know how the structure is of that. I think that was part of the comment too, is about making sure the homeowners association, the master one can, can control that as this stormwater coming through the site is from the larger subdivision as well. So um, I guess I'm, I'm not concerned. Um, I think between Drew and I, we can figure out the, the details. Thanks, Angel. Um, you know, for what it's worth on the larger issues, I'll just weigh in and say that I think the extra off street part in my line of work dealt with uh, layouts like this in condominium life. Um, the extra parking spaces actually make sense. Uh, I've seen them fully utilized with off street parking before. I think it also provides an opportunity to leave some of the spots available to uh, other people in the neighborhood, the uh, maybe even guests. Uh, or visitors to the area. So I'm okay with the additional parking spots as presented here. Um, and then as far as the Ross Walk, I, I also agree, I think with the applicant, I'm not 100% sure it's necessary there. Again, going back to some of my professional experience, I've actually had association remove, um, or unwillingly, their, uh, their snow plows have either removed it for them or the residents have you know, voted to remove them uh, as more of an annoyance, than anything. Um, especially kind of in a parking lot where you're not gonna really see a whole lot of th through traffic I'm okay with uh, you know, just the marked pedestrian walkway rather than a raised one. Um, so as far as general comments uh, on those items, I don't, um, you know, I think uh, if I heard correctly, you, you were on board with requests um, from staff. Um, is that accurate? Yeah. The so, landscaping, I think you broke up a little bit. So, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the buffering, yeah, the additional buffering and landscaping. Um, yeah, we're happy to work with staff on the right planting location you, for that you, buffer, if that yeah. makes sense. And um, Angela, just to follow up on the association docs, it is set up that way, but we can review that prior to, to the next time in front of the board to make sure it's covered. Thank you. So I think um, I covered the big points, at least from my perspective. Uh, ask if there's any other comments or questions from the board. I'm scrolling through, so keep your hand up for me. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I had a question for staff um, in terms of the number of uh, actually, one uh, two bedroom apartments, uh, condos that there were. I think that's what I'm looking at in here. Um, oh, the bedroom count for buildings two and three. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, according to this, it, the staff comment, it appears that the bedroom count for buildings two and three, including 12, include 12 two bedroom apartments, not 11 two bedrooms and one one bedroom as the plans depict. Well, the plans do depict uh, 11 two bedrooms and one one bedroom. So could somebody uh, help me with my confusion? I, I'm oh. happy to, if you want, because we, um, the, each 12 unit building has 11 two bedrooms in one one bedroom. And the six unit building has five two bedrooms in one one bedroom. The architect mislabeled, I think, a few of the one bedrooms. So they're designed as one bedrooms. I think there was a two where there shouldn't have been a two. Um, okay, thank you. I, I, cause I had, I had looked and I had counted and uh, noted that um, there was uh, basically uh, the, the package room in each of the buildings. 
uh, which took away one of the bedrooms. Right. Uh, and that was from uh, a lesson from prior prior plans. So I probably didn't even look to see that they were it was labeled as a two bedroom because I had read it as a one bedroom when I looked at it. So appreciate that. Um, I do have a, a comment about the architecture. It is, uh, it is the, again, it is very in keeping with the downs. Um, it is uh, good architecture, it's modern. Um, I would simply say that at some point there's a lot or too much of a good thing. This is now the third um, plan that's come before us with this type of apartment. I, and changing the color is good. It might be that changing the colors even a little more uh, dramatically than, than you're planning um, is very helpful to provide some variety. Um, we've gotten comments in the past about the number of white buildings, uh, white blocks along the housing leading into the downs, uh, the initial housing and um, I'd like to make sure that uh, we don't have a lot of comments about, well, now we have three large developments that all kind of look the same. So I just, you know, lay, lay that out as uh, something for you to consider if there's an additional way to make a distinction with these buildings, it would be helpful. The, the buildings themselves are well designed, the apartments are great, I like the storage areas, I think people are going to uh, really appreciate living here. Um, they're going to uh, do the do the downs proud, um, but just remember that at some point we've seen enough of these gables, uh, these types of buildings. Um, is there any place making here? So the um, we've designed the. I was going to go to the landscaping plan here. This best shows it. So we've provided um, some sitting areas on both the front and the rear of each um, building along the walkways um, for more kind of public um, outdoor space and, and sitting. And then um, we provide kind of these landscaped areas for the more private uh, outdoor space for each unit. Um, and then each of these buildings is kind of tied into the to the sidewalk and the multi-use path. That's what this is here. You likely remember from town center residential approval um, that this connects up along the downs road to future phases as a multi-use path. It also connects over. This is right across the street from Front Runner, um, and the sidewalk system that goes up Front Runner and connects into the placemaking. Um, in the wetland park area, which is off the screen, but it's really only a block up um, from this site. So we have both on site, um, some place making and then strong connections to the rest of the project. All right, it, uh, it just looks to me as though there might be a little space to the, uh, I'm never clear whether it's north or south, but to the, the bottom building, the lower building, Building there, yeah, uh, and a little bit to the left. Is that some uh, space right through there that's uh, potential to put a couple of conversation area there? Now that's an area that we were thinking about um, providing some additional, like a few additional trees or landscaping per staff's comment. So we can we can look at that um, be between now and our our next submission back to the board. Yeah, I, I, I think the area does need more trees, but I think it might also be possible to set up sort of what you could call a conversation area with a, a couple of benches in them in among the trees. Um, so I'd, I'd like you to take a look at that. People will go on the trails and they, they will walk around, but sometimes they'll just want to sit right near their buildings. So that would be that would be helpful. Um, I think, uh, was there anything else on the comments that you wanted to respond to? I did notice um, that the, the road impact fee assessment uh, should be coming and the site distance assessment for the proposed driveways, all of those are going to be coming with the next 
Next yeah, actually, um, the we've uh, since we received staff comments, we have calculated the impact fee, um, and, and we can get that to, to the peer reviewer. Um, I think the submission did include that other information, but it may have been in a place that was difficult for the reviewer to find. Uh, in terms of the site distance um, that was in the submission, and I think the other um, comments by the, the traffic engineer were in it, but we'll get it to the top of the <laughs> on the first page and work with the reviewer prior to your next review so it's it's not overlooked um okay thank you and uh, another good job thank you uh jen there we go sorry um First of all, I just have a question. Can you hear me okay? Hold on. Um, I just have a question about the garages. Are those, um, is, there a, is there a solid wall in between those two bays or if someone parked on the, the backside, are they able to walk through to the front? Um, no, there is a wall between um, the, the bays. So those are separate bays to be owned by separate residents um the pedestrian connection is only outside so you would walk using this sidewalk and, and crosswalk to get to your unit if you have if you're you know parking on the back side of the garage so similarly to the other project too where there's like um independent overhead doors for each like are they that separate yes yeah they're yeah. fully enclosed garage garage bays yeah okay um Thanks for clarifying. Um, um, I do not have any issue with the waiver as proposed. Um, the um, on the topic of parking, you know, I'm. Um, I think it's interesting to, you know, where this, where all of these projects are new. Um, part of me thinks that you should, you know, if there's any opportunity for sort of a partial build out or for prepping some of the base materials for that auxiliary parking, but not fully finishing it in case it's not needed, um, just because it would be a shame to, you know, put in. 10 extra spaces here and 10 extra spaces on um you know other individual pieces of this without fully knowing um you know how all the pieces interact and what that means in terms of parking demand um, i do like the idea of the on-street parking here as an opportunity to provide guest spaces or deliveries or whatnot um, for these buildings and also um to just kind of break up the street treatment a little bit through here. I think that is a good idea um, and I hope it's utilized. Um, on the other hand, I've lived in an apartment complex where there was nowhere for people to park as a guest. So that's frustrating too. Um, I, you know, I guess we do set minimums for parking and you're meeting the minimum. Um, you know, I, I guess I would, I would like to see, uh, you know, a little bit more um, justification for those, or or what, you know. I mean, I can speak to the on street a bit. Um, so one of our concerns, if you will, is these on street parking spaces are likely to be used as much or maybe more for the cottages on the green across the street. So mm -hmm. one of the one of the challenges for if you can remember, not maybe I'll go back to this, let's see. This is probably better, more helpful. So we're talking here, these these parking spaces are here. They're right across from these homes here. Um, particularly the single family on the green, those cottages on the green, there isn't on street parking really dedicated to those um, and the guest parking isn't 
it's pretty limited for those lots. So we think that the ones in front of um, lot two will likely to be used for those as well. Um, and this is all kind of new and we're all kind of learning to see what is the kind of the, the parking demand. Um, so we didn't want to rely entirely on the, those on street parking spaces for the gables and felt like there's an opportunity where way below the impervious limit, um, like by 25% on lot two and felt like it made sense to provide a little bit extra parking on site for guests for the gables so that these the Downs Road on street parking is more of a shared um, for the entire neighborhood. Um, so that's really why we're doing it. Um, and we think it, it makes sense overall to kind of have that quantity of parking and, and to provide these on site um, to, to have less kind of reliance on the on street only for, for this particular site. How's that working with the, um the residential portions of the project that are currently built out do you have um you know is there extra parking that's being used or is there a demand that you're aware of that's not being met in that way um you mean in phase one yeah i think there's been i mean in phase one the single family homes um, didn't have dedicated guest parking um, because we didn't have, it's a bit different layout um, and, and didn't do that. And I think that's been one of the things that's been desired for this next phase is to have a bit more of guest parking, overflow parking, et cetera. Um, so, you know, a lessons learned kind of thing from, from staff perspective is, is to have some of this dedicated guest parking so we're trying to make up for maybe some parking pinch that we have in in that first phase particularly around the grist mill um and the apartment section of the project um okay that's not to beat parking to death but those are some of my questions um i do like uh, I, I appreciated Rachel's comment about both trying to squeeze in additional um, trees, but also some place making in that uh, southerly, southeasterly corner yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I do think that's a good idea. Um, and I'm sure that you have, you know, you have creative team on staff that will come up with something of interest there. Um, I don't think I have any other, too many other questions um as long as angela and uh the rest of staff and the board are all set working through some of the other um, stormwater access issues um yeah no i think this looks good uh one other comment just um formality more than anything i without all the other hard copies. I don't keep the hard copies. Um, I think Rachel does. Rachel, you probably have such a library by now. <laughs> um, but it was a little bit hard for me just kind of off the cuff to place this um, lot in context with the rest of um, the development, particularly with what's been um, designed, I, I will say. So, um, for example, you're, this is a little bit small, but thank you for pointing out that this is across the street from single family homes. But so that was, it was a little bit tricky to, um, just to remember that in terms of how this sits contextually with some of the other pieces of the project. Um, and I know there are so many uh, layers within which you could provide us 10 graphics every single time with like, here's where it sits in Scarborough in general, all the way down to this is what's across the street. Um, but just uh, in this case, because we were seeing it for the first time, that it was just a little bit um, tricky, but thanks for pointing that out, at least in your um, presentation. That's all I have. Roger. Sure. Um, Dan, could you um, refresh my memory? What, is, what are the colors of um, Tandem Court, the buildings? Tandem Court's a darker, 
um, I would say a darker gray. And what is this color? This, this looks like it's gray. gray. A lighter gray. This is, oh, it's, so they're both gray. One's darker than the other? Yes. Okay, and what is Hayloft? Hayloft is uh, a blue. Um, the majority of the buildings are um, I would say like a medium blue. I don't know the exact description. Um, and one building has uh, in that first floor commercial space has yeah. um, white siding. Um, but the majority of those buildings are, are blue with white trim. So they look good. And they're also a different size building uh, dimensionally. They have a different, those are 86 feet long, these are 104. Um, and there's some different architectural components to those in addition to color. The apartment. Okay. Um, I think the buildings look, look good and everything. I just, I just wanted about a little bit more variety. That's all. Um, I, I think the buildings that, that um, Rocky has built over there at Carrier Woods look pretty attractive. Um, and I, I think now that's that that's tandem court right there, right? No, this is this. This that's is this one gables on uh, tandem court. Um, they're uh, darker color than this. Oh, OK. All right. OK. All right. Um, all right. I won't go on that. Um, just another thought um, down behind the parking garage garages. Isn't that where there's going to be a Willowbrook like parkway or something down there. Did, wasn't it? Am I incorrect about that? Or wasn't wasn't he supposed to be designing some sort of a um, like a, a little parkway or something along Willowbrook? Oh, um, maybe this plan that that we were discussing uh, that's that's more zoomed out. So this is the lot here. Um, yeah. And we have a, there's a multi-use path that starts right in front of this project um, that was approved and it's now under construction um, that goes up and follows the Downs Road. Um, and it's a tree-lined boulevard with that pathway. Yeah. And it's, it parallels Willowdale Brook, which is right here. And otherwise, Willowdale Brook is, is, um, is buffer. Buffer property. So, if that's what you're thinking of, Roger, and then that will continue into Town Center North, which is um, off the left, and and we reviewed that extensively as part of that subdivision, where that multi-use path continues all the way up to um, Center Street. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, regarding the parking, I um, I think uh, condos or apartments need to have enough parking because people typically do have company. And they do need to have a find a place to park, and um, people who are, who are living there get annoyed when, they, when some guest goes and parks in their, their particular parking spot. So I I don't have a problem with the parking at all. Um, I I think everything's fine. You've answered a lot of questions. Um, as long as Angela's satisfied, I'm happy. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Rick Munking. You know, one of the beauties of being towards the end, a lot of questions have been asked and, and good answers have been provided. Um, I don't necessarily have a problem with those additional parking spots. Um, the impact on those could be mitigated a little bit if we uh, chose to maybe uh, do some, some uh, sustainability efforts in these buildings. Um, it'd be great if we got less combustion in these buildings, maybe offering um, zone controls with uh, variable refrigerant flow systems for heating and cooling, as well as maybe providing opportunities for the uh, condo association to be able to um, elect to have community solar or something like that. And with the garages there, it might be a nice opportunity to have uh, lay some piping or uh, the groundwork for uh, providing uh, 
some renewable energy opportunities for, for those residents that choose to live there. Um, those are just some thoughts that I have. Uh, would love to see, you know, uh, a little bit of the, the sustainability impacts that modern building technologies now offer and uh, see if those can be employed in, in um, this type of uh, setting. I, I think with condo association makes a nice way of providing that, that flexibility. Um, the lighting plan looks well thought out. Wall packs are, are there and, and I think uh, even with the off street parking there provides enough uh, light and controls of those lights are, are um, part of the plan here. So um, this is a nice looking uh, project. Um, I, I just would emphasize the, the value of being a good partner in, in uh, the sustainability of our community. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Any other questions from the planning board? Rachel? Yeah, it's not a question, but I just realized I didn't say anything about the parking. Um, I, I have no problem with that parking. I, I would suggest that uh, you could perhaps put uh, sign it for visitors and that way it would be kept uh, clearer for actually for visitors to come in. Um, I am a little, I guess I'm a little concerned about the length of the parking across the back of the building. That's, what's that, 24 spaces? Uh, and the, the back, is that 24? The, right there. Uh, uncovered here along yeah. the, I believe it is. I believe you're right. Is okay, that, that's, that's correct. That's, that's a pretty big run of asphalt. Um, I, I, I guess um, one thing that, that you might want to take a look at is a couple of islands or an island in between each, each, uh, each building that um, when people look in between the buildings, they're not looking out into asphalt, but they're looking into as kind of an extension of of the the grass and the landscaping in between the buildings, uh, that's that might be a way to uh, kind of make that a little a little more gentle, a little less stark, uh, and then add the the uh, six visitors, and you're you're in good shape. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so. So we do have um, the applicant is requesting a uh, subdivision and site plan approval this evening. Uh, just quick poll of the board. Do we think we're we're at that point here uh, based off of what we've seen and uh, based on the discussions? We're seeking preliminary just to be to be clear on what you think we're correct. Pre yes, yeah. preliminary. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, see some nodding heads, I think. I have to scroll, so you got to be patient with me as I search through so nod your heads longer please <laughs> thanks all right um so with that i'll um i'll make a motion to uh grant preliminary uh, subdivision and state plan approval for the gables llc lot two of the town center residential subdivision second 39 lot 32 i'm sorry lot two second i have a second any further discussion on this okay i'll do roll call rachel hendrickson yes Roger Bewey. Yes. Jennifer Ladd. Yes. Rick Meinking. Yes. Nick McGee. Yes. Show that five zero. All right. Thank you and good luck, gentlemen. We'll see you again. Thanks. All right. And Rick, based off of your comment that you liked going last, so you didn't have to talk much, guess who's going first on this next one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Next item of tonight's agenda is Dana Forty, a request a subdivision amendment review for the Pintan subdivision assessors map R93, lot 36. Jamal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so this is also located in the RF zoning district. 
um, south of the Pleasant Hill neighborhood. The applicant's proposing to expand the approved building envelope on lot one within the existing subdivision. Uh, so the existing subdivision does include building envelopes, uh, most of which are reduced in size uh, throughout the development. So typically reduced size envelopes such as these are approved to limit the total amount of disturbance for a subdivision that needs to be treated by a stormwater management system, such as this one. Um, and in reviewing, reviewing the file here in the office, uh, the site is subject to a main DEP site law permit. And that permit references that areas outside of the approved building envelopes will remain undisturbed. The so staff has suggested that the applicant uh, provide an update to the board and any correspondence to date with DEP as the approved uh, building envelopes on the plans as a condition of approval for the subdivision. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jamel. And for the applicant, uh, Dana Fortier. Kylie Mason? Yes, uh, and with, with me tonight, I do have Mr. and Mrs. Fortier, um, uh, who are the homeowners. So just to give everyone a brief update, um, uh, Jamel, if you wouldn't mind, um, I've asked for another copy of the order, but I guess I'm not seeing the uh, restriction uh, for clearing order if you would if you have a copy if you wouldn't mind um, pulling it up I'd be grateful um, I did actually in looking at it again I sent an email over to DEP asking for a different copy so but um, just kind of giving everyone an orientation this is the approved subdivision plan um, that was approved in 1996 uh, since that time the lots have been developed um, if you were to go there um, you would see you know, something pretty typical within Scarborough. Uh, you can see there's variable lot um, sizes, but also variable building envelopes. And really what I recall from our interaction was uh, there was a speculation that um, back in the 90s, you might see subdivisions approved this way in order to minimize their stormwater responsibilities through DEP. And while we're um, speculating that and accepting that as the description um, in our time meeting with staff, um, we haven't seen anything um, documented on the plans that describes that. So what we had talked about with staff at the time was, and this is the lot we're talking about here, was that um, to address that concern that any development that happened on the parcel as part of this acceptance would um, essentially receive stormwater treatment. So in the case of the shed, um, an acceptable BMP for DEP would be to provide a drip edge, a stone drip edge around the, the new construction. And we are proposing that. Um, so this whole um, lot uh, amendment is being put forward simply because uh, the 40 years would like to build a shed um, that could add some storage on their parcel. Um, they uh, learned of the boundary um, or the lot the building lot uh, envelope uh, when they applied for their building permit. And so working through the survey to understand where their lot, their lot and their building envelope was, um, we discovered the, the historic plan. And so what we're proposing is to bring the lot up to the current standards within the zone so that they might build their shed and have a lot that meets the current zoning. Um, and then just to give you a picture of the 12 by 20 shed they're proposing, um, it's a very small, very attractive shed. Uh, it would fit well within the lot. Uh, you can see that these are large, generous lots, um, over an acre or more, some of them in the six uh, plus range. Um, to give a, just a quick summary of my understanding from DEP, uh, because this is a site law permit, um, the new exemption does allow for clearing. Um, the um, amendments to a SLOTA permit are actually not for a clearing of vegetation, but rather for the creation of uh, impervious area. So area not revegetated. And so as I understand it, they would be within the um, exemption rules at DEP for site law. And with that, um, uh, Dana, I didn't know if you or your wife would like to present anything. Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, appreciate the introduction there, Kylie, and the information, um, and appreciate the uh, uh, planning board's uh, work. I know you guys have a very full agenda, so we appreciate the accommodation. Um, as Kylie mentioned, we're uh, looking for a simple, it's a 12 by 20 uh, garden shed, and um, uh, you know, obviously, um, 
gone through a fair bit of uh, gyrations here to put the garden shed in. Um, and uh, it's a little bit of a process, a uh, fair bit of expense, uh, I think much more than we anticipated um, uh, just to, to get the shed in. Um, I, I think the, the um, you know, the DEP, uh, you know, restrictions are, are probably um, new news as of tonight. Uh, so um, I think that, uh, Kyla, you mentioned that this may be uh, something that's uh, handled uh, through an exception process. That's, that seems to be fairly straightforward. But um, uh, I think, you know, um, I'm hoping this is a fairly straightforward project. Um, again, it's a temporary building, a movable building. You know, it's not a, uh, not a shed on a uh, concrete pad. It's on a gravel pad. Um, so with that, you know, appreciate any uh, comments or feedback. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we do have the ability for a public comment. If there's anyone here that would like to speak on this topic, please use the speaker. Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna turn this over to the board. Rick Meinking, as promised. Uh, just a couple of questions. Are you gonna run power out there? Not currently. Um, we may uh, at some point in the future. Um, you know, they have some lights, uh, but uh, not currently planned. Not, not right in the plan. So there would be no lighting or anything like that going on on the outside of the building. It's just to store bikes and things. What's that? Just to store bikes and uh, kid stuff. Get them out of the garage, right? So yep. we can work out in COVID, yeah. <laughs> um, no, this seems pretty straightforward to me, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't really have any, any concerns with this. Um, you know, I know our, our able staff shepherds the things through and talks with the applicant and uh, it's before us now. Um, it looks very straightforward and I think uh, um, this looks pretty good. I like the uh, I like the rendering of the of the shed going out there, and uh, uh, I think this will help the the applicant and uh, enjoy the as she says the COVID times and be able to work out. And uh, who knows what that's gonna how long that's gonna last, but uh, um, I'm okay with this. Thanks, Rick. You're on mute, Roger. There you go. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, is this is this a similar situation to Riverwalk? Is that what Riverwoods? I mean, the only thing where this has to go through DEP. So yeah, I'll I'll, I'll just jump in. I think you know, I think when I think as Kylie mentioned, obviously this this plan, like many, it's always hard to try to understand what the planning boards. Um, position was 25 plus years ago or so looking at um, subdivisions that have these large lots and sort of these these unconventional building layouts where you know there was a 15 foot side yard and your rear yard set back back in the mid 90s and so what what sort of was happening at the time of this planning board approval and so that was part of the due diligence that we were doing was going through the file as we were reviewing this application and that's where we came across the DEP. Uh, again, can't remember offhand, I don't have the file in front of me so I can't pull it up and you know, show it to folks that we don't have an electronic copy. This is a mid nineties, but we could certainly scan it um, file, but it uh, referenced the maintaining um, the, the buffers as shown on the plan. So I think that's where, as you just said, Roger, this is similar to that, where there is a standing DEP permit that we were able to find on the file. But that's not recorded. That's that's not recorded in my deed. Um, so I, I think we have a discrepancy there between what's recorded in the deed and, um, you know, there's putting in, I think, what is an unnecessary restriction on my lot, um, you know, for, for something that, uh, you know, really is, you know, the, the DEP, if, it, if we want to put, we want to talk about putting a condition in there for addressing the drainage, then great. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we just looked at some projects. There's a project actually directly across the street from me at Pin, to Pendale Point Drive 
Uh, it's a six car garage that was built to two story six car garage uh, permitted and built on that lot. And um, I'm fairly certain it's well outside of the building envelope. Uh, so it's a uh, lot uh, number 10 there on the plan that's in front of you. Um, so I, I think we, you know, I don't feel that I'm asking for anything unreasonable here. I've spent over $3,000 going through the process to get this information to the planning board, um, tried to uh, be a, an upstanding citizen and go through the process of getting a permit, uh, and then had to go through the process of rezoning my lot, um, all for putting in a 12 by 20 garden shed. So certainly asking for some relief here um, and uh, uh, some sense of understanding, you know, I can understand and work with what uh, I can, you know, what is a clear uh, issue, but um, there isn't clarity around why something exists uh, or what I should address. And, it's difficult. Um, I, actually, I have no problem with the shed. Um, it's just the um, technical requirements, whether this has to be cleared with um, or corrected through DEP. That's that's my only. I guess, how do we get clarity on that? Because when we, we've been, I guess, dealing with this since July and, and Jay, it sounds like tonight you, you said it somewhere, but you don't uh, how do we yeah, get we, that documented? If I, yeah, if we, I might, um, I think if I if I could add some clarity here, um, typically a buffer uh, through DEP, if it was described as a buffer, would actually have a, a deed and an easement requirement that it would actually have to be pinned out in the field. Um, I, I'd be happy to look at, at this with staff to see if it was described as a buffer or simply um, if it was just one of the standard conditions that show up in a DEP order that areas that were showed not to be disturbed would be left undisturbed. Um, but as I described, under site location, um, I believe it's section 388, um, that exemption does allow for, um, for additional development to occur in a site location of development permit. Uh, and the clarifying component of that is that it's um, disturbance not revegetated up to a certain amount of square footage. And so because this is not, um, any clearing would not be an issue of revegetation. It would be completely vegetated. I think we're focusing really on um, allowing their lot to meet um, zoning standards and then uh, to place the shed, which certainly would fall within um, the impervious thresholds. And then to the point that we've met with staff, uh, we have provided additional stormwater treatment, which would meet any of the um, you know, speculation that we had that there was some sort of stormwater uh, component to it. But without seeing the exact order that um, staff is looking at, I would like that clarity. And as I said, I did reach out to DEP. Um, the order we had did not um, talk about any, any vegetated buffers uh, specifically. So I think if there's, a, if there's a document out there, I'd certainly like to see it. Can I, Can I just quickly ask a question there to clarify something as well? Uh, <clears throat> Is it my understanding that if the shed was being proposed within the original building envelope, this really would be an issue? My understanding that right. we would not require plan and board action at that time. It would just be a simple building permit process through the code office, correct? Right. Then, since it's outside of the building envelope, and for whatever reason, the developer at the time, right, it's a condition for the plan requested that these envelopes be a certain way, right? My house is set so far back on my um, on my line that putting my shed in my backyard, uh, even if it was against the back end of the, the building envelope, would put my shed almost right at the bottom of my deck stairs. Um, yeah, I think um, you know just for what it's worth. I mean, I don't think anyone here on this board enjoys the uh, the process that our residents have to go through in some of these situations for sheds and. And whatnot, seeing as that this is the, the second one this evening, um, and we've seen them before too. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of a sad commentary on sometimes how to, how we can get too ahead of ourselves and in, in, in uh, saving the world, and then at the same time forget about you know some of the common sense elements of, of planning. Um, so, uh, with that though, I don't I don't want to occupy an immense amount of time here talking about. Uh, the shed as far as reasonable next steps um, are we in a position uh, to kind of offer something similar to what happened earlier this evening we can work through some sort of conditional approval on this 
or um, are we pretty hamstrung by DEP needs to provide us with uh, their permit? And I see, I see Angela kind of nodding and I'm gonna jump in, Angela. Well, I guess um, backing up a little bit, I know we have other subdivisions and towns we've had to deal with this in a non-compliance um, with with trying to build outside the building envelopes. And so, as Kylie said, there is a process. This isn't the first time this has been requested or asked for. I think it gets into different exemptions and really that's not for this board, it's for DEP to kind of issue. And I guess um, I'm agreeing that I don't think it's a stormwater buffer because as Kylie said, those are, are deeded and pinned and those are um, recorded. This is more about the, the, the language in the permit. And again, it's the DEP permit, not the local permit, um, specifically about building envelopes. And then locally, we kind of ran with that, it looks like, and kept that similarly. Um, so at the time, um, and, and the board has seen this even recently, developers coming in and wanting to build smaller stormwater footprints. And so they limit the amount of area, even though you have a six acre lot, we've seen it where they show a clearing of one acre and trying to cram a septic system and a well and a house all together. And so that's kind of, um, there's nothing to limit in the ordinance the developer from doing that or limit, you know, does it kind of for the planning board not to approve something like that. It's more about these common sense. And so to have these conversations, and I know recently the board has been really good about that and trying to figure out, can you actually provide a lot that people want to to buy and know what they're buying and know that they can fit what they need on their lot in that buildable area. So I just don't want to get in a situation where we are um, providing a, an approval that is in direct conflict with a DEP permit um, because that puts in the town in a very awkward position and um, not a good light. <laughs> so we kind of go back and forth and I do a lot of, what I do is cleaning up a lot of these things and trying to work with DEP. So I'd rather be ahead of it than behind it. And so to get clarification from DEP, I think would be important. I would agree. I think it's um, I think it's a simple thing that we could simply just work. Um, if it is an exemption, then we can just get a statement of that, and, would, and it's pretty straightforward. And I would mention that Rick, your comment too about utilities out there is another good one because um, it would be good to know that ahead if you have any intention of doing those type of things because that should be part of what you're requesting from DEP rather than going back in a year or two and have to do this all over again. Um, cause you, if, if you have any inkling that you're going to want to do something like that, like run underground power or something, then you need to figure that out. I think it just, just a heads up on that. Yeah, we can okay. certainly add that to the plan. Um, yeah. I, I certainly would be good to understand what's written. I know that we've had some correspondence with, um, uh, with staff, uh, to date on, on some of this. And so this kind of, um, new news tonight, which is uh, perhaps a little bit unfortunate, but um, uh, so, but we can add the power to the plan. And um, uh, what I would ask though, is that if we, um, I'd like not to have to <laughs> um, sit through another uh, round of planning board meetings to uh, get approval for a shed. So would it be possible to gain approval based on DEP, uh, you know, getting clarity on the DEP component? Uh, that was what I was going to ask if, if we could, you know, at least um, let the applicant know how we feel about the shed. I, I don't think that's going to be an issue. And that way, once they do get the DEP approval um, it's, and staff, you know, staff is satisfied with it, then everything's all set. Yeah, what I, what I might offer, and I think Nick, you sort of alluded to, is there a way to sort of take a look at this issue that's similarly to Riverwoods? And I think, you know, with Riverwoods, again, I think there the board really separated the questions. There were two different issues. There was the, the lot line adjustment, and then there was the buffer question. And really the board set the buffer question aside until the DEP came forward with an answer. 
And I think, you know, locally what the conversation that Jamel, Angela and others have had is, you know, if and should the DEP be satisfied, then we don't think that, you know, there's a, a major issue here, but that's certainly the fact that, again, you know, we, we have, we're seeing that, that DEP permit sort of holding that. Um, maybe the way to look at it is to think about this potentially coming back to the, if the board's comfortable with the general parameters and assuming that DEP ultimately is on board as well, um, that this come back just as a simple consent item. And the reason I mentioned that is sometimes the site law permit, who knows how long that could take. And if the board's approval, um, you know, we don't have a, you know, there's only a certain time frame to get the plan signed and recorded. And so depending on how long that process takes, you know, consent obviously is very quick and, you know, one, you know, it's not even really a conversation at that point, um, that that would be a way to potentially move it forward if the board, um, certainly the board can. Uh, I guess I'll ask this, is there anyone on this board that is uncomfortable with going through to a consent if they show up with, uh, to staff with their DEP letter? If I, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair, um, the, as I see this, this is most likely going to fall under a DEP exemption under site law. There wouldn't necessarily be a statement from DEP, a letter, there, there would simply be an email. Um, because that wouldn't require an amendment to the site law permit, because it would fall under the exemption, there would be no amendment to wait for. I would wager, I guess, that uh, the four years probably would not want to go through a site law amendment process. Um, simply because the application fee and process is cumbersome, um, probably beyond a local process. Um, and with that and understanding the exemptions that are in place, I, I can't imagine that would be an issue under the exemption. So if I might, I think I would, I would suggest and ask uh, the board to consider um, making an approval condition on a DEP, um, I guess, uh, authorization. Um, as opposed to making a consent item and not ask the four years to to lay waiting for the next planning board meeting to have an approval. Excuse me. Um, what I'm hearing is though that staff is uncomfortable with that approach. I mean, that I'll just throw it out here. Uh, is staff uncomfortable with that? It's just not typical with your current policy with outside agencies approvals or correspondence in hand. And this was sent out on, on October 22nd. So it's not like it's brand new news this evening. It was in the staff review comments. Right, so but for, October 22nd was the Friday before the meeting. Two Fridays ago. So it wasn't, it's not a brand new issue tonight. I just wanna make that clear. I do want to say that I, I think for people trying to do the right thing, this is a really hard process to go through. And I think that people would be discouraged. And I can imagine people putting sheds out there because this is so difficult. And while thank you, Jamel, for pointing out that it was the 22nd, but I think we requested this in July and we're trying to do the right thing here. And that feels like it's really difficult. Yeah, the, and with, also with regard to the um question of a DEP approval. I think, you know, precedent's already been set tonight of a DEP approval, conditional DEP approval item, um, I believe with, was the Riverwoods uh, item, so. Um, yeah, and actually that was the point I was trying to make is that the board didn't get yeah. a conditional approval with that one. What they approved was a lot line adjustment and they set aside the question of the DEP permit. Again, board, as, as you know, right, as the board the has heard me say many times, we will act at the discretion of the board. Um, so, yeah. however. Yeah, this is, a, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a bad situation all the way around, in my personal opinion. Um, I just see items like this uh, languish. This, this board, though, I mean, I've been on the board for seven years, I has, uh, not once, I believe, deviated from having DEP permits in hand before animals. Um, if anyone, Roger's been on the board quite a while. I don't know if Jay, Jay, you've been around since I've been around. So I don't remember anyone deviating from that policy. And so I guess the question is Kylie's approach. I mean, it seems like a very reasonable. Um, 
she's she's asking us to grant you an actual approval without the DEP permit. Or no, I'm asking DEP. a conditional. Right. And 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 Jay, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Has this board ever the DEP uh, an approval awaiting a DEP? Um, I. It may have happened. I can't, you know, honestly, I don't know offhand, Nick. Um, I know there's been- It's put you on the spot like that, but- Yep, yes. Um, you know, there's, over over the course of 13 years, there's been a lot of different conditions or waivers that the board has sure. considered throughout time. So, I, you know. So, I mean, I guess at this point, it just rests on the board, their comfort level with um, going ahead and doing a, um, well, we, I guess we got two options in front of us, right? One, uh, we go through the process that has been standing and they they can be put on for a consent item or two, we can uh, grant their conditional approval uh, pending they provide staff with the appropriate DEP, um, what, what would you call them, authorizations? Or amendments, yeah, again, not knowing exactly what the process is. I, I understand uh, Ms. Mason has Things that you know, we we just don't know what that process looks like yet. And I would say that I mean, this would not be an amendment because they simply won't be able to afford going through an amendment process. All right, board. Can I, can I ask? Our jobs. Can I? Ask, yeah, um, Mr. Fortier, uh, or Mrs. Um, indicated that they started this process back in July. Is that correct? What, what happened in July? You went to our, our planning department? We submitted for a permit and the permit was denied and there wasn't any, we weren't given any course of action. So we reached out to Sebago Technics to help us survey our land and walk us through this process because we didn't know what else to do. And eventually we've ended up here. But we've had our site surveyed where, as my husband said, we've spent at this point, in addition to whatever we'll pay for the shed, We've spent $3,000 just to get the information to come to this meeting and to pay the $600 fee to come to this meeting today. Well, personally, that disturbs me. And it's taken since July to this point, this yeah, particular I mean, item clarified. I certainly don't want to ask anybody to uh, to do something that's outside of the process. Um, you know, I think that uh, what colleagues proposed seems like a reasonable solution, um, given that we're we won't be able to get a permit unless uh, unless the staff is satisfied with with the information that we would get from the DEP. Um, again, we are not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill here. I no, I think we I think we all understand and sympathize yeah. with your position. I think at, right now at this point, I need to get the board. Um, to weigh in. I think staff's made their position clear. I think your your engineers uh, tried to help as, as well as you. So, uh, so Roger, we got to we got to push this one way or the other. Are we going to go through the process and wait for uh, put it back on for a consent item, or uh, are we just going to do uh, additional approval tonight? Well, well, I hate to go against staff, but I I just I. I <laughs> I wish we could do something conditional to, or just to be able to move this along and uh, make it easier for people. Is it is it worth pointing out that we're a week, we're only two weeks away, right, from our next meeting, because this is this is a continuation from last week. So even if you were. Um, even if this were to be placed as a consent agenda, it would would it be heard at the next meeting, which would be in two weeks? No, we, aren't, aren't we past the submission deadline for the next agenda? We are, and I think they would need some sort of DEP correspondence anyway. So it, I don't know. It depends on when they hear from them. Right. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. So Jennifer, you want to weigh in? I just don't like this. I'm sorry. I have a shed of my own and I'm so glad right now that it's already there and that I don't have to go through this myself. Um, uh, and I know that we all feel that way because we all own property here and it's just a really 
crappy situation. I'm sure that when you wanted a shed, you had no idea about a giant DEP permit that blanketed your whole subdivision. That's my guess. Um, that said, I do, you know, I do think that um, there is some value in hearing from the DEP on this one um, in terms of just what how they would weigh in and uh, just confirming that it would fall under an exemption um, before actually before actually approving it. Thanks, Jennifer. Rachel. Yeah, I we we managed to uh, kind of split the baby um, earlier this evening because there were some things, a couple of things that went on that were actually within our purview. Um, but we couldn't do it with the, the DEP and I, I think uh, I am most comfortable with uh, putting this on a consent agenda. Um, I, I had a great deal of sympathy and understand the costs involved uh, and would hate to try to undertake it in my subdivision. Um, but we do have, as a planning board, an, an obligation to, to sometimes make decisions that we don't personally like to make, but uh, by, the, by the regulations, um, we need to make them. And I, I think the consent agenda, consent item is the, uh, the best thing to do with this. Thank you, Rachel. Rick thinking? Uh, yeah, all this for a shed, but um, I I think the consent agenda item is appropriate and we can get this done and, and uh, keep consistency and, and uh, uh, maintain the support uh, for the staff that, that have to uh, uh, deal with this with other applicants coming down the line. At least they, they, they have some level of uh, assurance that that um, the planning board will will uh, have the best word I guess is support support the process and support the the uh, the ordinances in the way they were written to to protect everybody uh, so I'm, I'm in favor of just getting this on a consent after DEPs weighed in. So um, can I uh, ask a question just in terms of the consent item, um, Kylie, you had mentioned that, um, is that possible um, with what we have or is, is it, sure. are we talking about just confirming the DEP um, approval? Sure, um, and it's really about time and, and um, the Scarborough planning agenda is quite popular these days. It would just draw everyone's attention. I have pulled up the state statute for site law um, that describes exemption for new construction or modification of an existing development. And it describes the exemption and how it applies. And since this is a site law application, what I would ask and, and what we will be asking the DEP to verify, and we have used it on other developments in the state of Maine, is that this is um, this would be additional disturbed area not to be revegetated um, that is under 10,000 square feet but that any disturbance specifically to that, if we are describing a buffer, it's not vegetated, it's not a forested buffer, it's not a stormwater buffer because it hasn't been pinned and recorded in the registry of deeds. It would say is simply a, one of those typical notes that shows up on, a, on an order, especially in the early 90s, and that this exemption would cover that because this would be disturbance revegetated and that the only disturbance that would not be revegetated would in fact be the shed, which is under 10,000 square feet. And then I would, I would simply say that we have made, because this was part of the discussion we had um, when, when the applicant did come forward, was how can we uh, provide stormwater for new disturbance and new impervious? And I think we've done that very successfully with a drip edge. Um, and so since we're talking about a lot line and the, the item brought up, uh, is a buffer that was referenced on an order. Um, it seems to me that the state statute does allow for this exemption. It seems that if the if what the direction we want to go is a consent item, then I would ask that most likely what we're going to receive is simply an email from a DEP permitting agent. 
um, verifying this because you can see that the requirement is simply that you provide notification to DEP, not that you ask for permission from DEP. So I assume then that evidence would be turned over to staff, is that correct? Staff would right, but basically there's not, look at it and say, yeah. There's really nothing for, if we simply just provide the notification as is required by the statute, there's not really anything required from a response. So I can some, I can ask for it. Um, can can I ask does the staff have a, um, a disagree with that uh, the exemption description? I think it. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Jump in. Go ahead, Angela. Yep. Um, I think as Kylie pointed out from the very beginning, it really depends on the language and how it's read and how DEP interprets it. So it would be asking staff to, to determine how DEP would interpret it. And I, I, I'm not comfortable with that tonight. Doing that for, for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think she's so, right with the exemptions. And that's why I pointed out to the four years, if you're gonna do it, do it once and just say, this is what we're gonna do. I think it's gonna be an easier process that way. Um, and get it out of there. Um, I also don't know if it's an active homeowners association, if you're talking about reporting annually, are there others and is this an accumulative kind of thing? Or that's something that DEP would have to look at. So I, I understand there's exemptions and, and people get them all the time. They come through this office and we, when we see those. Um, so I, I'd want to have a, a bigger conversation about it, I guess, than just trying to figure out if this meets everything. Um, and like I said, kind of making that interpretation for DEP. Yeah, I think just to, to, to jump on to Angela's point, I think this is sort of one of the struggles that locally we, we typically have when it's a state or an, another agency's permit. That's, you know, we're, we're really it's hard for us to interpret what their what their rules are. We think we may know, but that's, um, but you know. So I think, as has already been pointed out, from a local perspective, we typically would have a 15 foot side yard setback, and so I think staff's generally comfortable with the proposal. If we see something from DEP, that's you know, I, I think we're all <laughs> we're all feeling the frustrations that the 40 years are expressing. We we understand them and we appreciate them. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes we wind up in the position of having to sort of say, well, there's this thing and there's, we need to understand that. And so that's sort of, again. Um, yeah, I, I certainly, certainly understand the challenges with, uh, with the DEP permit. Yeah. Um, I think what we're trying to drive towards is how can we get through this um, in, in a way that still allows uh, the town to meet its obligations, but also uh, simplify the process a little bit for us. Um, and I think that, and just so you, you appreciate from 40 years, uh, a consent, you know, that's typically something we put early on the agenda, because again, the board's really talked about it and provided the board is generally comfortable hearing that staff is, you know, as soon as we see something from the state level that they're fine too, then this is on the agenda very early, it comes up, Basically, the chair says, anyone have, <laughs> have anything additional on this? Typically, there isn't anything. And then there, the motion's read, and it's dispensed with within minutes. <laughs> um, so it is. I would say with Jay, yeah, it's typical that consent items are right, you know, right after our, you know, minutes. And, you know, it's one of the, one of the first things we take up, right? Because it's a mm -hmm. quick vote um, rather than a full pre presentation and then a vote. Um, let me ask one more clarifying question. Um, is there is there a way to get on an agenda in two weeks if they turn in a letter or an email or whatever it might be? And is there is it by statute too late to get onto an agenda for the planning board for two weeks from now? I mean, I guess one one thing we could look at if there's no other concerns from the board. Um, we could, where the agenda gets set tomorrow, we could put this on the agenda and just know that, you know, we're waiting on that DEP commentary. And if that doesn't come in, then we'll table it at the next meeting. We could table it, right? 
yep. Oh, and yeah. then it would just come up three right weeks there, later whenever that DEP is in hand. Um, so if the I can, board is, you know. Kylie, is that something that you can turn around to the, the town staff tomorrow as a request to be on the agenda? Absolutely, we appreciate the Again. consideration. We'll we'll reach out to DEP um, and we'll send an email tomorrow asking to be put on the agenda for considering them. I think I can get a response from the DEP in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Okay, so I think that's where you're headed, and hopefully that gives you a look. And you know, we we really all appreciate the frustration you've gone through here. Uh, it's not often we have engineers design sheds for people. Um, actually, it's probably the worst one of the worst things you can look at here as a planning board member, because you know the system is not entirely working. Up. So, um, but again, we we do our best, um, and you got to respect that staff and town and these board members. We want to respect. Uh, not just uh, the local authority, but the, uh, the state authority on some of these projects as well. We, we appreciate, appreciate it. Um, we'll see you hopefully in two weeks, and it will be quick and easy for you. Thank okay. you. Great. I did want to. I did want to tell the uh, staff we appreciate because the application was turned in in October, and they did do a phenomenal job of getting it on the agenda. So we do appreciate that. Great. We'll uh, continue to coordinate with everyone, and uh, appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, and good luck. Thank you. All right, next, next item on tonight's agenda. Crossroad Holdings requests a subdivision amendment review for the Innovation District subdivision within the Downs, Assessors Matthew 53, lots one through 55. Jamel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a pretty uh, simple proposed amendment. Uh, the applicants propose to combine lots 46, 47, and 55 into a single lot into a reconfigured lot of 3.17 acres. And at this point, staff has no further comments. Thank you, Jamal. And Nancy. Um, this is Dan, I'm gonna present this one really quick. Um, and Jamal did a great introduction. And the only thing I have to add is this plan here that illustrates uh, lot 46 when it's combined. So if you can see my hand, um, this is the location of the, the new lot 46, and it's created by combining 47, 46, and 55 to accommodate the, uh, the next applicant on your agenda. Thanks. Happy to answer questions. All right. We do have opportunity for public comment on this item. I'd like to speak on this. Please use the raise my hand feature. All right. Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Uh, Board, any comments, questions? All right, seeing none, Jamel. I move to approve the project titled Fourth Amended so Overall Subdivision Plan proposed by Crossroad Holdings LLC as depicted on the plan set prepared by Girl Palm 10520 with the following findings and conditions. The, the proposed Fourth Amendment subdivision plan includes a com combination of lots 45, 47, and 55 into one lot. The proposed reconfigured lot is 3.17 acres in size and depicted as lot 46. Subdivision is located within the Crossroads Planned Development, CPD Zoning District, and is further identified on the Town of Scarborough tax map as map U53 lot 4. Conditions. The existing condition from the July 22nd, 29th Board Division approval will remain in effect. We have a second. Second. I have a second. Any discussion? Okay. I'm going to call the roll. Uh, in favor, Rachel Hendrickson. Yes. Yes. Roger Bealey. Yes. Rick Mikeing. Yes. Jennifer Ladd. Yes. Rick McGee. Yes. Thank you. I show that is unanimous. Thank you. Next item on tonight's agenda is Foria LLC requests a site plan review for lots 46, 47, 55 within the Innovation District subdivision at the Downs Assessors Map U53, lots 46, 47, and 55. Probably should have reworded that to represent lot 46. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Jamil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So on the new lot 46, uh, the applicants propose to construct a 44,160 square foot building. That will consist of product preparation, light assembly, refurbishment areas, storage, and future office space. Uh, the project is on lot 46 and um, at the end of Immersion Drive, uh, private access drive actually across the street from Zoom, the Zoom Drain site. The staff did have several comments uh, related to the proposed driveways on the site. 
Um, one of those comments was about the southerly driveway um, and its width and how there was an opportunity, uh, appeared to be an opportunity to extend the landscape island um, to narrow the width of the driveway and also provide a refuge area for pedestrians um, utilizing the crosswalk. And then Seth also noted that the northerly driveway is 40 feet wide um, and uh, did recommend that this be narrowed as much as possible. Uh, a few other recommendations. Uh, the next one was to just provide additional plantings within the landscape island uh, to the west of the building, just to uh, help screen the project and large building from abutting properties. And then the, the applicant's also proposing um, 20 parking spaces instead of the required 120 uh, for the building square footage. So the, as the board knows, the zoning ordinance does allow the board to uh, reduce the requirements for off-street parking spaces if it's determined that the use can be, uh, that the project can go on without uh, the required spaces. Um, so they're, once again, they're, they're provi uh, proposing 20 spaces instead of the 120 and believe that they can, uh, the project will be fine with those spaces. Um, and finally, uh, the applicant should discuss the proposed building design and the interior functionality uh, with the board. At this point, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jamel. Uh, Nancy. Chair, sure, thank you. Um, my name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm here tonight with Jim Van Fleet, who should be uh, joining us. Uh, Jim will do a portion of our presentation, but I'd like to get started uh, with a description of the site. Uh, Jamel did a great introduction uh, to the site. Uh, as you see on the screen, hopefully you all can see it and hear me well tonight. Uh, the plan that uh, is before you is for the consolidated three lots that you folks just approved uh, as part of the amendment to the Innovation District. So these three lots are now uh, lot 46 in the Innovation District. They had been lots 46, 47, and 55. So the three lots are basically, there's one here, there's one here, and one down here. So they're all consolidated into a 3.17 acre site. Uh, the applicant is proposing a building that is approximately 44,799 square feet, which includes the building plus the dock appendage, which is located uh, on this area here. There are also provisions for uh, additional upstairs uh, second floor space uh, in the future, uh, which would be a 10,000 square foot storage area and up to 2,500 square feet of uh, office space in the building. So as Jamel pointed out, we're proposing 20 parking spaces on the site and they're located in, this is the uh, west side of the building, this is the south side of the building. So in the southwest corner, are these 20 proposed parking spaces along with additional spaces at the rear. The function of the building, Jim will get into the discussion of the internal function of the building, but this is a design build for uh, mainly tubs and it allows uh, certain operational aspects of their uh, pain road site to be relocated to this site. And so we'll talk a little bit about the internal functions when uh, Jim gets on and discusses that, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the site. Uh, we have a program that allows for truck circulation around the entire perimeter of the building in a general clockwise position. There are two docks here at the dock appendage, and then they're allowed to access onto Immersion Drive. This is a private drive. Uh, that is one of the uh, one of several drives that are being constructed in the innovation district. We're on, if you folks recall from the reviews of the projects on Dynamic Drive, we are located south of Innovation Way and a little bit to the east of those uh, projects. So this is uh, one of the new sites on in, in Immersion Drive. And if you recall from our last presentation last Monday, you folks approved the zoom drain lot, which is located right here. So this is the driveway entrance to zoom drain, and this is the circulation pattern around the zoom drain building and access back onto immersion drive. So if you recall from our presentation, we talked about the fact that we had coordinated with the subutting site and provided for our access uh, to tie in at this shared location here with access onto immersion drive. The other aspect of the use of the site is with regard to 
the smaller delivery vehicles that will actually uh, take the tubs and take them to homeowners, to sites. So in that process, the trucks would actually come around the building here. They are, they are a truck and a trailer, a large pickup truck, three quarter ton with a trailer behind it that, that tows uh, the tubs to the individual sites. So they would come along here and access an overhead door on the east side of the building. The tubs would be loaded onto the trucks in this area here and the, the vehicles will actually exit the west side of the building by this overhead door. So uh, our, the simplest maneuver for those vehicles is to actually exit and come out to the north and then use the north exit to get onto Immersion Drive. Uh, so the pattern of circulation allows that sort of looped configuration all the way around the building in a general clockwise uh, position. It is a two-way uh, circulation pattern uh, simply because as you folks had seen in the packet, we have a parking exhibit based on the size of the building. This building would by ordinance require 120 parking spaces on the site. We are proposing 20. Uh, but in that expanded parking exhibit, you'll see that that parking would occur on sort of the outer edges of this drive aisle. So that provides for a two-way parking configuration in the event that that additional parking were ever needed. In addition, that allows for the truck maneuvering. Uh, the trailer trucks that come and deliver the tubs are quite sizable vehicles. So we wanted to make sure we had adequate maneuvering area for them. That's what dictates the width of the driveways on the south side, as well as on the north side. Uh, we received staff comments. One of the requests was to look at uh, trying to tighten up this entrance as well as this one. In particular on this one, you'll see we have done that. This graphic represents that change. What we've provided is for a extended island. We've reconfigured the walkway such that the walkway is within a curbed island area. So there's a little bit more refuge for any pedestrian that might be in this area. And we've straightened the crosswalk. On the plans that you folks had, that came down sort of at an angle and came around and into the site there. So we've tightened that up. Um, so at this location here, uh, we are asking for a 38 foot width. And at this location here, we're asking for an 83 foot width. We have provided the truck maneuvering uh, templates that show the vehicle exiting, the, the trailer truck exiting. This dock area needs that location right there. Uh, in order to clear and that's sort of what dictates in that location uh, there what what that width can be but we have tightened it up uh, as best that we can uh, allowing for appropriate maneuvering the same configuration up here we tightened it up but we do have to allow that truck to come in and enter there so uh, as part of our review process, we are asking for three waivers. Those waivers are with regard to the entrances we've just described, as well as the separation distance from the edge of curb here to the edge of curb there. Um, that's actually increased with this revision as well. So we're looking at a three foot separation there. And realistically from the separation of the vehicle from here to here, it's on the order of about 22 feet. Um, the third waiver that we're asking for is with regard to the drive aisle width. Uh, and we're asking that it be 24 feet as opposed to 25 feet. Um, in the process of <clears throat> doing these modifications that we've discussed, we also looked at adjusting the pavement edge here to reduce a little bit of the impervious cover uh, on the site. So we've actually had a reduction in impervious cover with these changes that have been requested by staff such that we are, we had been, um, a little bit um, under 66.9%. If you recall in the innovation district, the threshold is 80% of impervious cover. So we're well below it. With the changes that we've just made, we've taken out another 1,486 square feet of impervious area. So we're actually down to a little over 66.5%. So we're well within the coverage requirements uh, for the innovation district such that we don't need to uh, do any on-site stormwater treatment. All of the stormwater from the site is collected in the storm drain system 
It's being constructed in Immersion Drive, and it goes up to Wet Pond 1, which is located northwest of us, uh, and is the, the large pond that's been constructed on the site. The um, project has been approved by the Scarborough Sanitary District. We received their approval on the 22nd of October, and we are awaiting our Port and Water District sign-off letter. The um, plans also include a landscape plan, which as Jamel noted, there was some recommendations for some additional landscaping on the site. This graphic represents the additional landscaping that we've added. Uh, there are, originally there were three Princeton elm trees along Immersion Drive. We've added two additional trees and they are uh, honey locust trees, uh, which are located uh, in the gaps, if you will. So they're providing a little bit of diversity of color and size uh, and shape uh, to augment the plantings along this area here. We've also added that along this area here, the original plan had Northwood red maples. We've added additional Northwood red maples in this area here to continue that band around and supplement the trees that are located on this end, which are sugar maples. And we also have Norway spruce as an evergreen buffer along this area here. We've also added along this edge of the building, which would be the east edge of the building, we have Armstrong maples. And along this edge and along this corner, we have Amelanchiers or shadbush, which are uh, fairly common throughout other planting plans in the Innovation District. The maples that you see in this area here are comparable to the maples that were on the approved plan for the project across the street as well. These two trees were on the original, uh, the previously approved plan for the abutter, and we've added additional Korean fir as an evergreen to shield around the dumpster area. So we have added uh, additional landscaping from what you see on your plan uh, to address uh, the staff comments that we've received. In addition, for placemaking, uh, we do have some pedestrian scale amenities on the site. In this location here, we have a proposed pad and an area for a picnic table uh, to provide an outdoor space for uh, anyone uh, working or, or using the facility. In this area here, we have a large open meadow area, which is envisioned to be able to have some passive recreational opportunities as well. In addition, we had a bike rack that was located over here. And in accordance with staff recommendations, we've relocated that bike rack to this location here, giving it a better proximity to the sidewalk network that ties into Immersion Drive. Remember um, the program with the shared bike head lane along the private drives that is also consistent here on both sides. And then we also have the crosswalk and the walkway to the crosswalk across the end of Immersion Drive. So we do have sort of a pedestrian loop, if you will, to be able to get out to Immersion Drive. We have some outdoor um, recreational space opportunities for those folks who are uh, at the site. Uh, speaking of the number of employees that we're looking at for the site, there are 11 delivery employees that would be uh, on the site, three uh, warehouse workers and potentially three additional workers who would be there throughout the day. Their operation timing is a little bit different than other uh, more traditional businesses. They're very early morning uh, and early afternoon, they, they end their, their work. So they're their trucks are loaded and they're out and they're on the road uh, and they're gone before the uh, morning peak traffic, if you will. Their delivery trucks that come in are early morning deliveries that come in to uh, bring uh, the tubs in this location here. Uh, and those happen, those trucks actually are on a, a fairly uh, limited schedule, if you will. During the winter months, they may get a truck every one or two weeks. During the peak season, they may get two trucks a week. And so we're not talking about a tremendous amount of truck traffic that will be making any deliveries to this area. During their peak season, they run three or four delivery of trucks of tubs to go to homeowners. Um, and then um, it drops off obviously in other other times of the year. 
and Jim can talk a little bit more uh, about that. So uh, as we mentioned, we're proposing only 20 parking spaces on the site, which accommodates the number of people that would be there uh, on the property. I'm going to uh, change a little bit now and talk to you about the building itself. And then we'll get into the building internal operations with Jim. And then I'd like to come back um, after Jim is done with his presentation, talk to you folks about uh, some of the other comments that we've received and, and um, the process moving forward. So um, the next item that I'd like to show you are just some of the building elevations so that you can see that it's, it's a two-tone uh, building program. This is the view as you would approach the site from Immersion Drive. So the overhead door that we talked about with the trucks exiting is shown on this side. The activities in that um, portion of the building uh, really focus sort of on this, what would be the southwest corner of the building. We do have some additional glazing uh, in this location here on the north side of the building on the northwest corner. Um, not a lot of activity there. Most of the activity is really happening uh, down in this area here. The upstairs uh, windows are to add light into the building, but also, also provide opportunities uh, once that uh, second floor mezzanine is constructed that there would be window access up there. We have a second emergency door uh, and some glazing on the north side as well. This is a, a straight on view. This would be the primary elevation view as you see it from Immersion Drive. This is the west wall. Uh, there's that overhead door that we talked about and there's the primary activity areas sort of in this area of the building. This rendering uh, is pre the addition of more landscaping in this area here. So there would be additional trees that would be placed in the middle uh, here as well. This is the secondary elevation. This is a back lot in the innovation district. So we're talking about 15% fenestration requirements on the both this north wall, that's the secondary elevation, and the west wall, which is the primary elevation. The plans submitted to you folks do show uh, that they have met the 15% required fenestration on both of those elevations. So this is, again, the north elevation of the site. These are perspective views at the dock area. So you can see that angle dock uh, projecting out. This is that southeast corner of the building. So there's your north wall. And uh, you can see the overhead door coming into the site. So that's where the smaller trucks would access. The building is designed such that those trucks can stay in there at night. Uh, and they'll be ready to go and to be loaded in the morning. And this is a bird's eye view of the site. You can see the dock, you can see the, the exit door um, for, the, for the vehicles exiting the site and the parking proposed uh, in this area here. So with that, I am going to turn it to Jim uh, if he's available and have him uh, speak to the building itself. I do have the floor plan that we can talk from as well, if Jim would like to use that. Sure, why don't you put that up, Nancy? Uh, thanks everybody for uh, this second week of uh, keeping us on what I hope is a schedule that will break ground this fall. Um, this is um, uh, an extension basically of activity that's been happening on the Payne Road. Rick, I'll tell you that the solar panels up there at the solar farm have been going for three months and we haven't yet seen a nickel from CMP. <laughs> that's, CMP's pro that's CMP's problem, but I'm glad you're gen generating. <laughs> and, and you could go charge up your car up there. There are two free spots. You are way, and, awesome. And nice educational display. I hope that someday there's a 550 kW capability on this roof. And so I'm looking at that. I won't do it right away, but uh, I've got to digest this whole thing. But there's a really good solar solar opportunity here. Um, at five days a week, um, uh, 14 people will be coming who now work on the Payne Road will be coming here to do their work. Three of them are schedulers and schedulers, and they uh, are product preparers. This is. Um, a facility, the south side of this facility at the bottom of your screen will be 
the area where uh, at least three quarters, sometimes nearly every delivery every day has accessories and various preparation required before it can get to a consumer's home. And so we have staff who are regularly assigned here that are now assigned up at the Payne Road who do that and will do it here. Um, the other 11 people are all part of the delivery crews who are now up at the Payne Road who will be who will come here in the early morning. They'll collect all their product and they'll go off in, in uh, three, three of our own delivery crews. There'll be an independent crew that comes from New Hampshire. Our expansion and growth has happened not only in Maine, but also in New Hampshire. We're, we're also growing uh, elsewhere in New Hampshire and, and, and this facility is designed to accommodate the product for Seacoast New Hampshire and, and all of our Maine activity. Um, so the, the, uh, the, they go out in the field, disperse themselves during the course of the day and they're back by generally two to 2.30 in the afternoon. They, uh, they stop at the Payne Road facility on the way back, drop off anything that uh, happens to uh, be taken for trade in because the refurbishment, refurbishment facility is still up on the Payne Road. And that's kind of the production facility that may someday come down here, but we don't have a clear line of sight on that yet. Um, but we've got the, the space uh, for it if and as necessary. Uh, and then they come back here, they bring their trucks in as Nancy described and, and, uh, and they either fill up if they have time uh, the next day's activity or they wait till the morning to fill up their trucks and get ready to go. Um, the, accessories that are a part of um, uh, that go into uh, each of the tubs come down um, every day. The shipping and receiving for, for all of mainly tubs happens at the Payne Road. And so the product that has to get scheduled for each of the particular tubs gets um, allocated on a daily basis. So a pickup truck comes down, brings whatever is necessary to here is the uh, vision that we have. So it's a, um, not a not a high activity location during the course of the day, um, but it's uh, critical for us. We've outgrown every facility that we have and, and uh, we're, we're blessed to be a COVID winner in all of this and, and need uh, this kind of space in order to uh, expand our business. What did I forget, Nancy, anything? Oh, I think, I think you um, have given a good description of that. <laughs> Uh, I guess as, a just... as a matter of levity, um, thank you very much for whoever named it Immersion Drive. <laughs> Seems particularly apropos for us. <laughs> so um, as, as we've described, um, we, we have received the uh, staff memoranda. We actually, as a team, have put together the entire response uh, to that memoranda. You've seen uh, a few of those items uh, in our discussion tonight, but we do have a full formal response that we had put together. Um, in going through that process, you know, we have um, been able to address the comments uh, that we have received to date. Uh, one of the things I did want to share with you is with regard to uh, Bill Bray's comments. Uh, Bill had asked for a few things in his memo uh, one of which was to have additional traffic counts that would be done on the site. And uh, Goral Palmer has, has uh, had a conversation and a meeting uh, with Bill to discuss that item in particular uh, and has shared with them information that Jim had already provided to Randy with regard to their staffing levels, with regard to the timing of their operation, the schedule of their staff, that type of thing. And based on that information, um, Bill has indicated that, that counts would not be necessary at this point, that that data does sub substantiate that. So Randy has put together a response to uh, Bill's comments that we will be working through with Bill uh, in the process of, of moving forward. And as I mentioned, we have prepared uh, the comment and response package that's typically required uh, to address staff and peer review memos. So we're, we're comfortable and we're confident that things have been addressed. We're hopeful that you folks would uh, consider granting approval. Uh, if it's not possible for that, we would ask that 
perhaps we'd be able to get on to the next agenda uh, as a consent item uh, if you folks are comfortable with that approach as well because we do feel that we've addressed uh, the staff comments and and don't feel that there's really anything particularly onerous that's outstanding uh, so with that i would certainly uh, take a, a look to discuss with you folks uh, your comments and um, hopefully an opportunity to uh, move forward. So thank you. Thanks, Nancy uh, and Jim. Um, <clears throat> so with this, um, I understand that, yeah, the request for a consent item, I think with the, the number of comments addressed, and you've done a good job addressing uh, the bulk of them here, uh, but giving you know the staff the extra time to review them is going to be really helpful. So, uh, based on how we go with this discussion, I'm comfortable uh, to answer your question with getting this to where I think you're you're right around the uh, area of getting there. So, um, I'm you know I'm okay with the reduced parking number. I know that's one of the questions in the reduced uh, aisle width. I you know I. I understand that I did provide us uh, plans showing what an expanded parking set could look like uh, if it, if the need ever arose, and I appreciate you doing that. So for the time being, uh, the applicant knowing what their staffing needs would be here at a location like this, um, or cover needs, it's uh, I'm fine with the, the amount of reduced parking we see. Um, thank you for addressing some of the comments from staff regarding the uh, drive aisle widths. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, the curb cut with and you what was your um what were you at before you went to 83 feet what was that number before, before you got 90. there 90 you were at 90. 90. we're able to take about seven off based off your modeling what were and we, that was basically because of the modeling from the tractor scrape tractor trailer trucks that's correct what we were able okay. to do is we, we combined that reduction with a redesign of the sidewalk so that the sidewalk shifted north, the island shifted south, we gave us a little bit better refuge for any pedestrian that might be in that walkway. Great. Um, so with that, I don't have a whole lot to add to what I've seen in the presentation. Do any of my fellow board members have questions or comments on this one? Rachel? Yeah, I was just wondering when uh, you anticipate putting the mezzanine of the second floor on, if is that uh, coming soon or? Uh, my guess is uh, right now we're still talking to the contractor. We think we might put 4,000 of just open mezzanine to get the structure in place and, and then allow us for the next year or two to understand what happens to our business to see whether it's even necessary. Um, uh, the nexus of our customer base is gonna be shifting a little bit to the south because we're expanding more in, in uh, central New Hampshire. So uh, we don't want to have to drive all the way from Scarborough to uh, Peterborough, New Hampshire to deliver a hot tub. We'd like, we may move some product elsewhere and hence not necessarily need everything that we have put on our wish list for the next 10 years for this building. Uh, it, it would be helpful to uh, take a look at that in the follow-up plans I, yeah I, I if nancy that. if nancy puts the the uh, floor plan up uh right now we're talking about that four thousand square feet uh, uh rachel being in the southwest corner above the area um yeah above the area where there are offices and mechanical rooms so uh four thousand square feet starts at the stairs and goes west and goes up pa just past the overhead door and so that area for parts and accessories is what we're thinking about, kind of an open mezzanine for now. Um, no no shelving? Uh, maybe shelving, but um, it, it's possible that the, some of the marketing material that's now up at the Payne Road may come down here. No, no staff, which is one of the things that we wanted to and did clarify with Bill Bray. Uh, so that initial build out of the mezzanine doesn't, doesn't have any staff. Right, and I, where, where would the support be for that? I, I can see the stairs, I'm looking down below and I don't see. Yeah, if right at the, at the end of the stairs, there's a post right there where, where Nancy's got her and there's another yeah. post over to the right of that. 
And so there, there is a huge post that runs that dotted line from east to west. Okay. And, and then the next set of posts is uh, going to be either 39 or 56 feet in from there. So that's enough for them to, the size of those girders will be such to allow for the build out of the mezzanine. All right, so basically the infrastructure's in place with a, Correct. To, to add it. If we, were um, to do it, if we were to do it, we didn't want to interrupt much of the normal flow and, and want to have the construction project going on simultaneously with stuff going on on the first floor, safety maintained, of course. Okay. Uh, I have no problem with the parking, and I actually have no problem with the consent agreement. I have no problem with the architecture. I have no problem with the landscaping. There must be something wrong, but it's just getting late, I guess. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> as, I, as I said, uh, I, I like your I like your place making. I mean, I've looked through this and tried to find something. It's been difficult. Uh, so you really have answered, um, really responded very well to the the questions that the the staff and the comments that the, the staff had there. So again, no problem if we go to consent agreement. You're Thank very you. kind. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Jen, I think I saw your hand up. Um, yeah, I was just curious. I know that at your Payne Road facility, you had at some point anyway, some outdoor um, either display or storage of hot tubs, but I noticed that you don't have that here. I don't know if that's a function of uh, lack of indoor space at Payne Road or if you in, at all um, in the future intend to also have outdoor storage or display area here? Uh, good question. We, we, um, we will not have any consumers coming here. Um, we, okay. we, we feel as if all consumers should be where they're used to going already. And some of the outdoor display tubs that you see periodically are the refurbished models, um, the used models that are in the parking lot from time to time. Some of those are also an accumulation of the trade-in models there has to be assessments of those as to whether or not they'll be refurbished or not. And if not, they're taken to the dump. Uh, we don't wanna populate this nice new area with a lot of that old stuff. There's room to take it now, and it's a closer run to take it to the recycling center from the Payne Road. Um, so for that reason, we don't anticipate outside storage here. Okay, thanks. Um, and I was, just curious, I appreciated the architectural um, elevations and renderings, uh, but I was curious what you had in mind for any type of signage or branding, I guess beyond, or maybe you don't have anything planned for beyond what you show um, on that, that overhang there. I, we don't at the moment, just because this is not an, we're not expecting Consumer. consumers to come here. Yep. And okay. it'll be a, you know, we'll have our nice logo there. It, it will say 100% employee owned because that's something we're very proud of. Um, but beyond that, we don't anticipate a lot of signage. That makes sense. Um, and then what's the size of, um, out of curiosity, what's, what size tractor trailer did was used on the turning template? um exhibit wb 67 okay um so i you know the well it does seem like that lower southerly yeah southerly driveway is pretty wide open um and i think you know possibly be tightened up a little bit more but i also um i've run those templates myself and i know that that can be it can be tricky to get those to work. And then um, obviously you don't wanna tighten that so much that it doesn't actually work in real life either. Um, but I was just curious about why the, um, can you point out what the dashed line is? I'm guessing it's a building offset maybe um, that runs north to south through the dumpster area? So 
this dashed line right here is the building setback line. Okay. Um, just I was just looking at the dumpster location and how that interacts with kind of the space that it looks like you might need to pull those the larger trucks through there um, and was just curious why that wasn't pulled over to the east a little bit but my guess is it was probably for that um, the, the larger trucks to fully pull out of the, right. the loading base. Um, I understand that you're well within the impervious percentages um, and at the end of the day, that probably doesn't make a, a huge bit of difference. Um, but thank you for the truck dimensions. I was curious about that. Other than that, I don't have any issue with the waiver for drive aisles um, or reduced parking. I appreciate the exhibit that shows the full build out for parking. Um, and I think that that's a great, um, great that you don't need to yet. Thank you. Uh, Rick or uh, Roger, do you have anything? Uh, no, um, I think they've responded to staff's comments really well, and um, I think it's a nice project. Um, it's a terrific addition for the Innovation District, and uh, I think um, Nancy has done a nice job coordinating everything with the neighbors right across the street, so I'm satisfied with everything. Thanks, Roger. Rick? Yeah, um, are you planning on doing a black roof or a white roof on this? Um, do you have it snow loaded? or maybe a white roof? I uh, can't answer that question, Rick. Uh, I'll, we'll find that answer out. Um, it, it is loaded for the panels though. It's loaded for the snow with panels. Uh, that, that was one of the stipulations. I don't, I don't okay. know whether it's black or white though. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you're, if you're thinking about the, the solar on there, which I think is great. And I, I know you'll, you'll do the right thing. Having the white roof will eliminate some of that, uh, you know, heat factor in the in the summertime. Um, but yeah. unfortunately, well, in the winter time, you get the you don't get the snow melting. But if you're putting panels on it, well, then the sun helps get rid of that snow load. So, with that, and the other thought that I just had, Jim, was maybe some light tubes um, that would be over your your inventory um, instead of putting in a bunch of lights uh, most of your activity is going to be done during the day um, and you'll have people there mostly during the daylight hours maybe uh, a few strategically placed light tubes uh, might be a, a a nice addition for the sustainability yeah good good thinking that's one of the reasons i put all those windows on the second floor not necessary of course but I wanted natural light in there. I didn't want to use any more electricity than I had to. And so we got those up high enough so that yeah. they, for the small portion, which would be offices, they'd be nice. But for the rest of it, it's going to provide a bunch of natural light into the space that will require us to use less electricity. Yeah, you're not going to you're not going to put those. Um, um, uh, I can't think of it. It's late. Uh, you know how you can bring the light uh, the visors over the windows? to bring in the light further into the interior space. Yeah, uh, you Let's know. Put the expense to that, put a couple light tubes in. Yeah, there you go. Um, anyway, I think this is a great looking building, uh, Jim, and I didn't realize that uh, hot tubs were such a commodity that you're expanding like this. This is a great oh. thing. Maybe the, it is a blessing for you guys because everybody sits in their backyard with a, a bottle of wine and a hot tub. You know, in 1994, when I first came to Scarborough, we were a uh, we were less than a $200,000 business. This year, we're going to be a $20 million business. And for our manufacturer, it's a it's a wonderful story of uh, of a, a group of people who now are the owners of the company doing the right thing by customers. We now have over 30,000 customers who have chosen us as their solution for relaxation. And, uh, well, I'm glad the Downs is available for you to explain. So are we. Good, it's just system. perfect. Excellent. Well, I, I have nothing. I'm fine with the drive aisle and, and waivers that have been asked for. And I think you put together a good package here and would be happy to see it on the consent agenda next, next time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Rick. All right. Um, 
not seeing any other comments at the moment. I think um, you're in really good shape. We look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. Hopefully, uh, take care of you then. All right. Thank you. And a special thank you to the staff who, uh, even today, they were jumping up and down, responding to emails and, and phone calls and getting us to a point where we could say what we said today, today to you honestly and with um, their thoughts in mind. So uh, great job making, making some lemonade here. I thought we were going to have some lemons, but uh, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great job, Nancy. No problem. Good luck. Thank Thanks. You. So we are past 10 o'clock and our apologies to uh, our last item of the night, which is Rhinan Properties. Uh, and unfortunately, we are to make that up this evening. Um, I want to do, I do want to say thank you to the board and the staff uh, and all of our applicants for being patient. And we took a huge chunk out of what has been an incredibly large workload and the number of hours that everyone's been putting in. Um, as volunteer board members, I know that's seven, almost eight hours worth of board meetings and uh, looking at prep time preparing for them and then for staff to be able to work as diligently, Angela, Jay and Jamel, um, as you have and Doreen, of course, who uh, sits there silently and takes our notes. Um, <laughs> so I, um, I really do appreciate all of the efforts here. So uh, with that, uh, I think we did staff report, administrative amendment report, correspondent, planning board comments. We did all that last time. Jay says, no, I've got more. Just Good day. I tried, man. <laughs> but just, just one quick one. Um, as Angela and Jamel and I were talking, I think it was last meeting or, or recently when we were talking about town center north at the Downs, it came up about doing a site visit. And it sounded like there was general consensus around that. But I don't ever think we sort of co, you know, cohesively said yes as a board we'd like to do a site visit so I guess that's the question to the board tonight and real quick if we hear a majority yeses we'll start the planning process offline and obviously work with the owner and all of you but so that's the only question I have tonight I think it's worthwhile for you know to try let, to, me, try let, to me, let me just ask is the site visit primarily to see that the uh, that secondary road because I think you can yeah, drive that down that secondary we road. Around. Yes, I think we you can, can drive down that here. secondary road right through right from Payne Road. So, is that a yes? I'm saying everybody could just go drive right down the road themselves. Oh. I'm not sure it really requires a site sidewalk, but if everybody wants to do it, that's fine with me. But. I don't mind going out there. We're not going to go to the track, you know. It, 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 seems, it seems to me that if we go out there, we can take a look at the whole construction area uh, and, and just simply get oriented on where things are in relation to other, other parts of the, of the development. So we could, we could take a look at innovation. We could see where um, the Gables uh, is coming in and see, you know, just really get a, a feel for the, the next steps that we're going to start to see. Yes, yeah, I think it's, I think it's worthwhile to just uh, shoot around an email so we can set up some times. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, without any other comments, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And I got a second from Roger in a form of a thumbs up. up. Any discussion? All in favor. Thank you so much, everyone. We really do Bye appreciate guys. it. Thank Have you. Have a good night.